has been a really well telegraphed bear market and it's been very orderly so far. The economy is probably going to be flat next year and that incorporates a couple of quarters of recession. We're looking at a recession here in the United States, shallow. Europe, I think, is already in recession and China's flatlining. What matters right now is when we're going to have inflation peaking and coming down steadily. It's pretty clear that goods prices are starting to normalize, but the market is also hoping that services prices will also normalize. If that's not the case, it's going to be a big problem. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen. You are sliding into the Thanksgiving holiday. We are not. The news flow is just extraordinary. And Lisa Bramowitz, John Farrow off today again, recovering from Saudi Arabia, Argentina. And, and Lisa, there's no other story today from Glo for Global Wall Street. And then in Zurich, it's not the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Credit Suisse fights for its life. It's the Wednesday before a fraught weekend as Credit Suisse tries to f come up with new options, basically reporting that they had $1.6 billion <laughs> of losses with nearly 10% Yes. of international wealth management clients pulling their cash. 10% of that money yeah. going away. And this really raises questions about the mainstay of one of the profit makers for the past couple of years. Let's be clear right from the start, and we'll repeat this through our coverage. Marion Haltermeyer will join us here uh, in the 6B block here in 10 minutes with her expertise on what's going on in Zurich. This is not a run on the bank. We don't want to be inflammatory like this. This is not people, it's not it's a wonderful life to get into the holiday mode, but what it is is asset management, and as you mentioned, foreign investors saying, give me my money out of wealth management. And just to put this into perspective, the bank is saying that the outflows were more pronounced at the beginning of <clears throat> October amid all of the turmoil about what the plan would be, and has actually tapered off. If you look at some of their perpetual bonds, they actually aren't seeing the same lows that they saw back in October. That nice. said, there is a feeling right now that Credit Suisse needs to make some very hard decisions, capital raises, selling assets, whatever it takes, in order to create right. some confidence in investors that it's not getting just yet. 30 minutes ago, Marion announces that they did approve the $4 billion ask. This is a dilutive effect on equity shareholders. They go out and look for new. Why do they do that? It's equity. Let's go to the Bloomberg terminal and look at the equity ratios of, say, three given banks. Credit Suisse is down to a paltry 4.5% of their pie is equity. Deutsche Bank improving under Mr. Savings is up to 6.7. And Fortress Diamond, this is gospel to James Diamond, at 36.9% shows you how fragile and how far Zurich is on this Wednesday morning. It's fragile in China, too. Apple doesn't know if they're going to get iPhones. Well, this has been a big issue. How much does China create this real tension, prioritizing <clears throat> economic growth and uh, COVID lockdowns and preventing uh, some sort of rampant spread? And you're seeing this in a factory, the main iPhone factory. Four out of five of the latest smartphones, of the latest iPhones, are manufactured here. Protests yeah. because they don't feel like they're being treated and well according to their uh, their protesting. I believe 200,000 people at this quote-unquote factory. It's like Henry Ford in the 1920s. There's video. To me, that's the big thing, is Beijing has images here of protest in China. They don't like images of protest. They would want to tamp down the social unrest yeah. that is clearly percolating up. <clears throat> the images of 200 protesters or more uh, really uh, becoming violent in some mm -hmm. cases and really pushing back against some of the uh, managers of right. this factory, basically saying, we are not going to take it anymore. Bitcoin, I got nothing to say. Chanelle Bassick's going to come on with a brief here to see if Bitcoin can get through Thanksgiving and on to a, a productive uh, December. What, before we do the data check, can we just say that what we've under played here, and maybe it's because Pharaoh's not in, the Dow Jones Industrial Average desk is up to a single digit decline. You're, you, a 12 months trailing, bring it up, uh, Amy, if you can. 12 months trailing, where are we in the equity market before we start the da data check and get into a Wall Street uh, pro as well? And basically, single digit Dow decline. Standard Poor's 500 is down 14, 15%, 12 months trailing. The Dow is down single digits. 12 months trailing, and NASDAQ comes in at a negative 28% uh, percent as well. That gets us to the data. I'm going to go to oil. Jeffrey Curry is scheduled to be with us. We pull back from $90, Brent Lisa, $86.53, dollar churning today. 
Let's be honest. It's quiet. It's Wednesday into Thanksgiving. I don't have much data to talk about. It's quiet for now. The data, perhaps, is not necessarily in the markets yet. It is going to trickle in starting at around 7 a.m. We get some mortgage data. 8.30 a.m. We get a host of data in the U.S. This is basically consolidating all of the information ahead of the Thanksgiving break. Initial jobless claims and durable goods orders at 9.45 uh, U.S. manufacturing and services, PMIs. Dump. It is a huge data dump. 10 a.m., University of Michigan sentiment for November and October new home <sighs> sales. I am keyed into sentiment. How much has that deteriorated or not? Have we seen a surprising upshift to kind of support the rally that we've seen? We saw those PMIs out of Europe coming in better than expected. How much do we see that repeated here in the United States? Today, this is interesting. You mentioned oil. The group of seven nations are aiming to announce some sort of price cap level for Russian oil today. Perhaps they're going to begin this on December 5th. That's the goal. What does this do in terms of pushing OPEC Plus yeah. to produce more? Will Russia co- uh, collaborate with this scheme? I mean, they basically they've said no. People say that's not going to be the case. It's complicated. I don't it's complicated. And Javier Blas, trying to provide clarity out on Twitter, says, look, this is $60 oil. We're arguing about maybe it's $70 oil. But it's already priced down because it's Russian oil, and they're capping, I guess, above it. So that it's, there's not a lot of tension here. How do you- I didn't understand a word of what Abe said. <laughs> how, you know, I, I well, try to look impressive. The big issue here is how do you penalize <clears throat> Russia, not allow them to profit from the need of the world for crude, for the need of the world of natural gas while still fulfilling that need? At 2 p.m., FOMC meeting minutes from the November meeting. Uh, very curious to see whether there is any fuel to this feeling in markets that the Fed not only is about to step right. down, but will reconsider how significant <clears throat> the uh, lag effects really are. Into our gas. And this is timely. John Deere is an arch company. It is in CFA level one. It is studied as an accounting exercise. And they account moments ago, and there is a single headline which speaks to the entrenched optimism of John Stolfus, chief investment strategist at Oppenheimer Asset Management. John, Deere and Company expects strong year in 2023. You look like a genius in this Q4 uh, of 2023 with an equity rally. How do corporations adjust to this historic 2022? Well, I I think, uh, uh, Tom, uh, you've got to say uh, the word that you all just used, it's complicated. Uh, And there needs to be essentially, for investors, you need to exercise patience, use somewhat uh, historical context. Uh, and consider fundamentals over technicals uh, if if you're going to uh, to be able to right. reap the rewards is what we think. OECD out of Paris two days ago with entrenched inflation through 2000, I think 23, maybe 24. Do you expect the nominal GDP reality, whether it's inflation or real GDP, to support revenue of American companies in 2023? I, I think it's very possible, and it's indicated by what we've seen this year in terms of we've seen uh, revenue growth in all 11 sectors in the most late, uh, the latest uh, in Q3 data. Uh, and in a quarter that was expected to be tough, you know, last I looked, earnings were, were positive overall. And it was, of course, the, it, uh, it was energy carried the ball, but you also had other sectors participate, including, as I recall, consumer discretionary actually had decent earnings in there. Um, You've got, uh, when you look at it, it's, uh, you know, managements have learned to work through periods of adversity since the great financial crisis through the pandemic and likely now through this period, which is really the end of free money and a a normalization, a new normal in essence where uh, bond issuers pay for the priv- privilege of borrowing money and, and bond buyers get something back in terms of yield. A lot of your view heading into 2023, and a lot of people would agree with you, John, is predicated on this idea of some sort of soft landing, shallow recession, basically something that is less bad than what's been priced in. How much does that cohere with this idea that the Fed is going to keep rates around 5 percent, 5 and a quarter percent for at least a year? Uh, we would have to think that it's very likely that that uh, five and a quarter, five and, and, and a half percent gets uh, gets realized and kept. Uh, we think the Fed is really determined to try to avoid a recession. I think it's more talking about the potential of a recession than anything else. When when Powell speaks and and offers the thought of discipline to le- highly leveraged players or 
formally deleveraging players, let's put it that way, on, on, on the, the trading area of, of, of the market. So we'd have to say we expect the Fed will likely, you know, do 50 to 75 uh, uh, in December. And after which we think the, the increases will be more modest uh, with a, with it, unless it's required by uh, any month where we got a, untoward levels of inflation in the CPI or in the core. John Sofels, thank you so much. Congratulations on optimism here through a fourth quarter where equities lift and we see deer lifting nicely, a 417 handle out up about eight, nine, ten dollars as well. John Deere with a nice uh, pop here as well. I'm going to go back to the great Phil Caray. Uh, Pioneer Funds Boston at 101 years old. I used to go up the elevator with Mr. Correy, uh, who was just extraordinary value investor. And he would talk about the bright lights of inflation. If inflation makes it easier for everybody out there because you get revenue growth with inflation. You wake up every morning, not like Credit Suisse, you wake up every morning, hey, Inflation, it's helping me. It's also the bright lights of exposure for those that don't have the revenue streams that can be maximized in an inflationary environment. It's almost the bright lights of turning on the overhead and getting a sense of what's actually on the ground. A company like Deer, great. A company like a number of these retailers that do have incredible business, doing well. A company like Carvana, flat on its Carvana. back. Because, no, I'm just saying, some of the online <clears throat> pandemic darlings not doing so well. And there is this question about how many more of those are going to fall out, even as you do see this resilience, as you've pointed out, as John Stoltzfus has rightly pointed out as well. What next for Credit Suisse? They have to restore investor You've got confidence. Twenty-four million dollars there. You've made it big. You got twenty-four million dollars in wealth management. What do you do after the news floated? How down? much do regulators, or how much is the Swiss National Bank no. involved? There's a headline. We'll talk about this. Marion here in a moment, our expert on Credit Suisse, where they've breached some regulatory barriers uh, in Zurich. It's a pennant formation for those that know your technical analysis. Credit Suisse, deeply under four Swiss francs per share. Really important that they announce in the last 45 minutes they will do a four billion or the ask to do a four billion Swiss franc equity raise. Stay with us. It is an eventful Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Futures up one. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In Chesapeake, Virginia, a shooter opened fire in a Walmart Tuesday night. Police say six people were killed. The shooter is also dead, although authorities aren't sure how he died. At least five people were wounded. Chesapeake is Virginia's second largest city and is located in Norfolk and Virginia Beach. Bloomberg has learned that the European Union is discussing capping the price of Russian crude oil at between $65 and $70 a barrel. The group of seven is also involved in the talks. EU ambassadors are meeting today with the aim of approving the cap mechanism and a proposed price level. There were violent protests at Apple's main iPhone plant in China. Hundreds of workers at the Foxconn factory battled security personnel after almost a month of tough restrictions intended to curb a COVID outbreak. According to a witness, the protests started overnight over unpaid wages and fears of spreading infection. Credit Suisse is warning that it will report a loss of up to $1.6 billion for the fourth quarter. Now, losses are expected in both the Wealth Management Division and the Investment Bank. Credit Suisse is undergoing a sweeping overhaul. Today, it will ask shareholders to approve a capital raise of about $4 billion. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. We want to go through the transformation of the next three years with a very, very strong capital base and leave the transformation also with a very strong capital base. It will become profitable definitely from 2024 onwards. The good Mr. Ulrich Kerner in charge of a Swiss bank under siege. It's Credit Suisse. You know the story if you're part of Global Wall Street. It has been a challenge for years, maybe signals by the acquisition of Donaldson Lufkin Generet uh, years ago. But the fact is today in crisis. Again, as Lisa and I mentioned earlier, folks, we want to be clear 
There is not a run on the bank. This is not like uh, it's a wonderful life or anything like that. But there has been an exit of assets from their wealth management that has shocked the financial world this morning, including our Marion Halftermeyer in Zurich. And we welcome her today. Marion, thank you so much for taking time out from your reporting. Will more assets exit from wealth management? That is a million dollar question, Tom Keen. Um, listen, everyone's watching that. Everyone's concerned about that. I think <clears throat> the thing we have to think about for this quarter is that it was a unique scenario. There was a lot of anticipation for how are they going to like restructure this bank? How are they going to save the bank um, from the demise everyone <clears throat> was speculating about? So you yeah. had this situation in early October where you had this sort of meme stock situation where a lot of speculation was happening and that sent people into a panic. Right. And so a lot of wealthy clients pulled assets and that's the number we're seeing come out today. We've got the equity uh, moments ago, like the last 45 minutes, we've got the approval for a 4 billion Swiss franc equity raise. But the question to me, and you've reported this and everyone else has as well, they have breached entry level or local level regulatory requirements. Is this the day where the Swiss government or some authority steps in to assist Credit Suisse forward? No, we're not at that point at this point. The, the breaches they've made are at different smaller entity levels. And so from an overall regulatory perspective, they've they've maintained the levels that are, are supposed to keep regulators comfortable. And on top of that, you know, with the, the capital raise that was approved today, we are seeing a strong bank. They're also issuing more debt, so they don't have trouble financing themselves. Um, the liquidity ratios that were breached on those specific entities were really related to, like, the, the assets that were being pulled out of those different entities. Marianne, what is the profile of the new Credit Suisse once it has raised, if they do fully approve uh, the $4 billion capital raise, if they do uh, continue with their plan to cut about 9,000 positions and in the face of some departures of senior executives? <laughs> Yeah, the, pro the profile of the bank is it's it's going to be interesting to see what we what we end up with in 2024 when they go through the bulk of the restructuring. But we're looking at a, a bank that wanted to really become a wealth manager, and it's sort of following the same path as UBS did post financial crisis, where they're downsizing the investment bank quite significantly. You know, we have the spinoff of First Boston, the revival of that boutique. Um, we have the sale of certain parts of the business, like the securitized product group to Apollo. Um, and then in wealth, they really wanted to beef that up. Now, the key difference here is that for them, they don't have the U.S., which, the U which UBS can rely on. They have to focus on Asia and other emerging markets, which can be a little bit more volatile. And in particular, that's what we're seeing with that reaction of all these asset outflows. So hopefully, I mean, that's what they want, is they want to be a strong wealth manager and look like a strong private bank, um, you know, with hopefully a couple trillion dollars of assets. But right now, they're, they're having a hard time breaching the $1 trillion level at this point. Meanwhile, one of the big investors that's come in to rescue them is the Saudi National Bank. How much controversy mm -hmm. is there around where some of the investments are coming from as they try to raise money? The Credit Suisse has always had strong investors from coming from the Middle East. The Qataris and the Saudis have long held positions in Credit Suisse. So from a Nunes' perspective, they've always been involved from a from a Swiss geopolitical perspective. There have been some concerns raised, um, but I think Credit Suisse sees it as you know we have diverse backing. We don't just have Middle East investors, and there will be other investors coming in oh, for different on. parts of the business. Mary, Mary, come on! Saudi Arabia beat Argentina in football. Is this the day where where the Middle East? beats the Swiss in Swiss banking. I've got on the screen 12% Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Qatar, when they're not watching football, has a 5% position as well. At what point does the Middle East take over this venerable Swiss bank? That's a, that's a question we'll, we'll have to see. I don't think that, you know, from a, a nationalistic perspective, I doubt the Swiss regulators would be interested in letting... A, a Swiss bank with such Swiss right. roots be completely controlled by, you know, a foreign a foreign entity. Um, I think for most banks in most national countries would not want their national banking champion to be owned by someone else. So I think we're far away from that fully. Um, but, you know, they, they, they've always relied on 
Middle Eastern investors, and I think that they will continue to see them as strong investors in their bank. Drama in Zurich. Marion Haltermeyer, have a great Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, Marion, is where the bird is cooked in America and the pilgrims came over. I don't, they don't do, I've been over there for Thanksgiving, actually. What, the pilgrims? No, not the pilgrims. I've been in Zurich for Thanksgiving. Oh, it's just, it's I wasn't sure which one you were talking brasserie, about. <laughs> brasserie Lip yeah. is not serving uh, turkey. Marion Haltermeyer, there's really on top of the story with Steve Ahrens in, in Frankfurt as is, is well. And I'm sorry, I go back to the ratios folks and you do you do compare the book value of credit suisse now is 0 0.22 on the bloomberg screen it's and that's struggling. like like is it a going concern and we get the confidence there from marion on what zurich is doing in a four billion dollar dilutive equity raise as well okay great but what do wealth management clients do? This becomes a real Why? problem, especially given the fact Why that this put up was with right, aesthetic? and that's a lot of them are not. The question is, can they get the rest to stay, and can they build a franchise around it? I do think the idea of casting some sunlight on the entire market is a really good one, and it can mean that so companies that are healthy do better because <clears> they do <throat> capitalize on inflation and the fact that there just is more cash running around, and those that are struggling uh, struggle right. even more because there definitely is a weeding out of the haves and the have-nots in terms of strength. With the urgency here on the beleaguered Swiss bank, we really didn't do a data check, and we've got one statistic today in the Bramo world, which is critical, further curve inversion. The vanilla spread down to negative 78 basis points. The two-year yield is 0.78% higher than the 10-year yield. I went back and looked on the chart. We're back to autumn of 1981. That's right. Mr. Powell is back to Mr. Volcker's time. Well, this is the first time since 1981 that we have seen the central bank hike rates to the same kind of degree, the same kind of pace. So this is exactly what we saw in terms of the pace of rate hikes. So it's not that surprising, perhaps, that the curve inversion uh, is what it is. I guess the issue that I have, and this goes to what John Stoltzfus started the show on, there is this belief that the Fed is not going to torpedo the economy, that there is going to be a soft landing. And that's what's baked into a lot of prices. That's what's baked into a lot of the optimism that you're hearing about the second half of 2023. That needs to be seen. But that is right now one of the consensuses heading into 2023. And now we go mainstream. The Thanksgiving obligatory what's it going to cost chart. I saw in the zeitgeist yesterday, restaurants are cheaper than home. If you're at home. And you're looking at sweet potatoes. I mean, it's. Are you looking at sweet potatoes? Sweet potatoes I'm are the I'm looking at cheapest. sweet potatoes. It's an outrage. Well, I mean, come on, up 11 percent, and that's like nothing. No, the stuffing is the real uh, is the real kicker. And that's 69%. not stuffing I cooked. Yeah. I, that's not <laughs> stuffing on radio. That's not <laughs> the stuffing I cook. What do you cook? Uh, it's terrible. It's un it's unedible. <laughs> Yum. Bloomberg surveillance and news flow is so extraordinary today, particularly out of Zurich, Switzerland, with Credit Suisse, that we barely had the lightness and the touch of a magisterial Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Lisa and I, uh, we're, we're dining together, the families. We decided both of our families are so miserable that we might as well get <laughs> together and exponentially compound the miserableness. We're going to have Top Chef with the uh, stuffing and see who does it worse. I think Swanson is in order. The Swanson TV <laughs> yes. dinners is what the Keen House is <laughs> Amen. having uh, as well. Actually, I, I saw a Flav City on YouTube giving a rave review to Swanson Broth. Well, we'll Rave have to check it out. I think that that might be uh, my homemade uh, experimentation. Yeah, we will see. But we're trying to get into the Thanksgiving mood, and it's tough with the news flow. It's been extraordinary. In Zurich, we're looking at China, serious protests uh, at an Apple manufacturer, Foxconn, and also the BitDog SAG. I believe it's Shanali Amy scheduled to be with us later. Did we talk to her people? Yeah, she we is. talked to Shanali's people, and she's going to be with us in the 8 o'clock hour for an update. Right now, one of the other stories out there is the ping pong ball known as oil. Jeffrey Curry provides leadership at Goldman Sachs, and I can only think of the great Adam Siminski at Deutsche Bank years ago. Here's a guy who actually goes into the Excel spreadsheets of figuring out supply and demand. Jeff Curry, what do your Goldman Sachs Excel spreadsheets say? about oil price next year based off the mystery of global demand? Well, we're definitely bullish come next spring, but what happens between now and next spring, that path is highly uncertain. You have China COVID cases surging, so you're getting forced lockdowns that were not planned. 
um, which is impacting demand up to about 1.2 million barrels per day. Coincidentally, the same size as the OPEC cut. So, you know, I think that's important development there. <clears throat> First time ever OPEC ever cut in anticipation of a demand loss. And then you have the G7 price cap, which just they keep rolling the dial and it gets milder and milder every day. You know, it's you know, least enforceable <clears throat> through shipping insurance. And then you also have the cap coming out at 65, right. 70, well above the 60 that really put the clamp on them. Let's go back to your Chicago microeconomics. What is the elasticity or responsiveness of demand if China wakes up and moves forward and comes out of COVID? How rapidly will that demand pick up when and if? Well, I mean, that's why, you know, we're sticking to our guns of $115 price target for next year, because when they do come out, um, they're going to put a lot of pressure, not only on oil, but the entire commodity complex. Um, and you can think about, you know, 2022 as really being in an environment in which the second largest economy in the world, the largest commodity consumer in the world was hibernating. So I think you're absolutely spot on. It's a game changer. Now, their base case is that, hey, they're making the preparations today to reopen into Q. But what did we learn in Hong Kong and Taiwan? is that eventually it spirals out of control. The cases get, you know, go up too quickly, and then you get a forced reopening. Right. And I think there's a lot of fear of that happening right now. One of the great realities is you pull an all-nighter at the University of Chicago, Curry teaching micro at Chicago years ago. You do that at Ed DeBevix. Lisa Bramowitz, very familiar with the retro diner in Chicago. So the, la the, the last from Chicago greets her colleague. All right, no need to, to sort of relive those moments ahead of Thanksgiving. Jeff, I am wondering, though, when you talk about the supply de demand dynamic and demand picking up with China. On the supply side, how much of Russia's oil has actually been taken off the market given the refineries in India and the exports over to Europe? I, I mean, it's relatively small. It's somewhere in that, you know, three to 400,000 barrels per day. You know, our, our expectations, it grows modestly uh, as the sanctions begin to take place and you have frictions and other issues involved. Um, but, you know, it's nowhere near as large as what people anticipated. But the offset on that is the investment across the space is far less than what people anticipated. Look at drilling in the U.S. Expectations <clears throat> of U.S. shale have been ratcheting down. Decline rates in non-OPEC X U.S. beginning to set in. So the supply problem or the underinvestment thesis, what we call the revenge of the old economy, is actually much stronger than we thought six months, a year ago. And again, it's not just an oil story. It's everything in the commodity space. This is really important, Jeff, because a lot of people think that we've already seen the supply shock. We've already seen so many barrels taken off the market because of the sanctions on Russia. What you're saying is that's not true, that we have yet to see the true supply constraints that have come from a lack of investment in the shale patch, a lack of investment by oil majors around the world, and now potentially some sort of disruption with Russia if they don't comply apply with the price caps being imposed by G7 allies. Is that your idea? When will it kick in the supply constraints that you predict? This is not a, you know, a tactical trading view. I mean, two years ago, in October of 2020, we called for a commodity super cycle, and we still stand by that view. And a commodity super cycle is not an upward trend in prices. It's spike after spike after spike. And this is going to go on and on until we have adequate investment to be able to grow supply. You need to grow um, hydrocarbons and until you have enough of green energy to be able to meet global demand. Right now, 81% of global energy still comes from hydrocarbons. You can't go to zero there and expect the other 20% to carry you. It's got to be an energy transition and we need that investment. And then to do the green investment, you need the metals. You need the copper, the alley, the nickel, lithium, cobalt, silver. You need all of those minerals to be able to invest in the green capex to be able to solve the the long-run decarbonization problem so this is not a near-term tactical view we just came off the back of one of the spikes that was well underway before um before the events in russia and we'll probably see another spike in 2023 as china begins to 
to reopen. But in terms of solving this problem, it requires large scale capital investment and the tunes of trillions of dollars. And we're not even close back. We haven't even scratched the surface yet. Although, By the way, uh, the one point I want to say is this cycle is no different than the ones that we saw in the 70s and 2000s. It's the same kind of commodity super cycle. Um, and what actually I want to make a point. Yeah. What preceded the 70s? The nifty 50 new economy. What preceded the 2000s? It was the dot com boom. What preceded this one? The fang boom. That's what we call the revenge of the old economy. New economy takes all the capital from the old economy, starves it of the investment it needs to grow the supply base. Um, which then shifts you into this super cycle environment. On the flip side, uh, what do you say is the revenge of the supply demand dynamic that when you hit 123, 125 dollars a barrel on WTI, demand destruction really comes into play, and we learned that over the past couple of months. How much does that cap where oil prices could go? Well, it depends on where the dollar is trading. Um, you know, obviously, in a really strong dollar environment. You know, the, the prices that many countries around the world experienced were all-time highs. While in the U.S., in a real term, the all-time high is somewhere around 190 back in 2008. Um, and we reached 130. It wasn't even close. But for Europe, pound sterling, Japanese yen, and many of these other currencies around the world, they experienced all-time high prices. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, to answer that question, yeah. you end up having to ask, where is the dollar trading? Now, I think the key view here in, in 2023 is, you know, you've seen a big run up in the dollar. As we see growth start to materialize in China and other parts of the world, we would expect the dollar to begin right. to taper off. And then you could open it up more for dollar denominated commodities. But the big event in 2022 was not the fundamental side of the commodities, but it was the dollar. Hey, Jeff, I want to jump to the Chinese wall here. And I want to go from Jeffrey Curry out to Neil Mehta. You've got, as any other firm has, a sell side looking at individual companies. How do you link your world and these constraints that lead to a higher Brent crude barrel over to their world, which is single stock selection, like his call, stunning call on ExxonMobil? Um, you know, when you look at the uh, way the equity's been trading, they've been looking through this yes, noise yes. In, the, in the commodity price because they're beginning to see that long-term story. And by the way, Exxon versus Microsoft exemplifies this revenge of the old economy story. You know, Tom, you've been doing this as long as I have. How many times have you seen Microsoft, the largest company in the world, and how many times have you seen Exxon, the largest company in right. the world? You, know, you go back to 2000, Microsoft on top, Exxon nowhere right. to be found. And then you you didn't invest in oil, and then you had that super cycle. 2010, yeah. Exxon on top, Microsoft on the bottom. Jeffrey, and reverse, in reverse. I've got eight it's, other questions, but we don't have time for it. Jeffrey Curry, thank you so much. With Goldman right. Sachs there, with a view on oil, and it's something we've heard, folks. And what I will say, I'm not going to throw the charts up right now because it's a Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Is it, it, We only have like four people in today, right? Everybody <laughs> else is off. We're Chuck in. Banner's off. Amy's off. And can I just tell you that that was actually a fascinating conversation? And the idea that we yeah, haven't the really you seen. Have. Mine suck. Oh, that's <laughs> not true. China's really yeah. interesting. This question of where that dynamic comes from, what the price caps are actually going to do in Europe. But more importantly, have we actually seen supply right. constrained by what's happened in Russia? The answer is not mm. yet. And that right. to me is salient. I'm not going to give you buy, hold, sell, but I'm going to tell you, as Mr. Curry said, as Dr. Curry said, it is simple. These oil stocks have not pulled back on the move from 120 down to 90. They have, it, look at the charts, yeah. folks, get them out. I don't have a chart here today, it's Thanksgiving. I have a chart <laughs> next Monday. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll pull up the chart. But you're absolutely right, but when you talk to investors, it's the same story. They all say they're still bullish on commodities. They're still bullish on oil. They're still bullish in this idea that the real economy requires more investment and is gonna do well in an inflationary cycle. And it has <clears> to <throat> find what you've seen. Yeah, Exxon near all time highs. I mean, this whole question here of how long can they keep rallying in the face of weaker energy prices seems like quite a bit is this exciting morocco my eyes are failing me they're in the 82nd minute morocco croatia there's a lot of zero zero games in the world cup i mean it's like the simpsons <laughs> i, think I, I that, mean i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm just celebrating the saudi arabia kick National the ball holiday. from farther out that's what i tell pharaoh did you hear Do that lionel messi is representing saudi arabia in some promotional kind of oh, uh, cool. football thing which is interesting because he just lost to them in the world cup so that's, is that you're awkward? killing it's it actually good. your depth of knowledge is yeah, shocking. It's just absolutely germany shocking. japan
Germany, Japan, what do you think? I think that it's going to happen. I don't have any insight that whatsoever. It's a long flight from Frankfurt. That's <laughs> there we what I go. know. Good Thank morning. you. Real insight. <laughs> Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. For the second time in just a few days, there's been a mass shooting in the U.S. This time it took place in Chesapeake, Virginia, where a shooter opened fire in a Walmart Tuesday night. Police say six people were killed, at least five others wounded. The gunman is also dead, although police aren't sure how he died. The disgraced founder of the collapsed crypto exchange FTX has apologized to staff in a letter. Sam Bankman Fried outlined what he called a crash in the collateral from 60 billion to 9 billion. So far, bankruptcy proceedings have depicted FTX as a business with unusual lax documentation and financial controls. It's a major blow to Donald Trump. The Supreme Court has cleared the way for a House committee to get six years of the former president's tax returns. It's a resounding triumph for Democrats after a three-year battle. Still, they have only a few weeks left to review the returns before Republicans take control of the House. Shares of Manchester United are higher in U.S. pre-market as its American owners consider selling the English football team. The Glazer family is working on a partial sale of the club or investments, including a stadium and infrastructure redevelopment. Now, the news comes after the team announced its parting ways with Cristiano Ronaldo after he publicly criticized the owner's manager and many of his own United teammates. Ronaldo is playing in the World Cup with Portugal. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. It's a choppy market into 23, but we do think on the other side, say second quarter, third quarter of next year, we're going to be buyers of equities. We're going to reset here in the United States. We'll lead the way, but it's a chop and a churn as we go through the central bank tightening, pandemic in China and recession energy related in Europe. As John stole earlier, Joseph Quinlan, he is at Merrill in Bank of America Private Bank, and it is always good to speak to these people that have seen a few cycles seen a few moments. Joe Quinlan with some good perspective there um, yesterday. A sleepy Wednesday. If you're just tuning in, guess what? It's not a sleepy Wednesday into Thanksgiving. I'm sorry. We've got protests at Apple Manufacturing uh, in uh, China. We'll get to that in a bit. We've been covering Credit Suisse with stunning withdrawals from their wealth management. It is not a run in the bank, but the stock drifts below four Swiss francs uh, per share. Stunning uh, there as well. And also Jeff Curry here on the conundrum of oil. Now we talk about the great readjust. We do this with data. I'm sorry, Amy. Let me do the data. Futures up five. Dow futures up 21. Dollar churning today. It's a Wednesday churn. Bond market giving me no live. Only a Bramble. It understands. What economic data matters today, Lisa? Is the University one, one of Michigan thing? confidence data, Michigan confidence. the initial okay. jobless right. claims, durable goods orders. Is every Fed speaker had, speaking? Well, no, mm. and we've got them uh, probably hibernating ahead of the uh, Thanksgiving break, but we are also yeah. getting PMIs in the U.S. following the PMIs that we got in Europe to see whether that potentially the yeah. manufacturing and service sectors also did better than bad. I think Jerome Powell, they, they don't cook turkey, they cook eagle. At the Jerome Powell House. I think that's endangered. I think that that's actually that's a joke I, from Stan Freeberg <laughs> from 50 years ago. Well, clearly I'm on it. You, you know, you cook the wrong bird. You know, they were supposed to cook the eagle, but they cooked the turkey. Is that enough Thanksgiving lore for you? I'm killing. I'm if Pharaoh killing was it. here, he wouldn't put up with that. <laughs> You'd have to put up with that. How does he get out of it? Can you give me some tips? I'm going to get out of it by going to Jennifer McKeon. She's just wonderful. She's at a wonderful shop, Capital Economics. Think of them like Axios. Axios came out of media day one. Uh, Jim and Mike were rocking it. Same with Capital Economics. Day one, they published, and everybody took them seriously as they should. Jennifer, you are readjusting in the next year. You bring down the so-called terminal rate. You're ratcheting down your interest rate gas into March of next year. Discuss that. 
Yeah, for for the UK, we we've just reduced our forecast. We had a relatively high peak um, of five percent, and that was partly following the mini budget, the fiscal stimulus that we saw coming at, at that time. We've just revised that peak down to four and a half um, percent next year, Why? partly uh, partly because of that fiscal stimulus not <laughs> coming, and in fact turning to tightening, albeit albeit a bit later on. Partly also because we're seeing some signs that perhaps the labour market isn't quite as tight at, as it was. There are some signs in um, surveys of wage negotiations of a bit of a let up. Uh, so we're not quite right. as worried about the inflation. Can picture. you take it over globally? Can you look at a, a misguess here of a higher terminal rate will be off the mark next year? Yeah, well, we thought for a long time that um, the, the U.S. terminal rate will be a bit lower than is priced in, into markets. We have a terminal rate of um, four, of four seven five to five um, there. Um, I, I think in the U.S. we're seeing much clearer evidence of price pressures <coughs> easing up, and that the U.K. seems to be following suit a little bit in, in that regard. So, uh, labour market's not as tight as it was. There are signs in um, some of the PPI elements that U.S. consumer price inflation is going to come down further. So, so we, we're pretty confident that the peak isn't too far off in the US, despite the fact that officials still sounding hawkish. Jennifer, I, I got to say, I got I to gotta kind of bother Tom here because he's raising questions about what we're cooking and that we might cook eagle, which is an endangered <laughs> species, and then, uh, you know, catching me um, off guard. So I will catch you off guard and say, at this point, is the better than bad news in Europe very bad news for what the ECB has to do for ECB officials to come out and hike more than people previously expected in the face of perhaps uh, better, stronger economic output? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I draw limited encouragement from from the recent European data. Industrial production has been a bit more resilient. Um, retail sales too. Some of that's temporary factors. There are some statistical quirks in the Irish data that have been driving up eurozone industrial production. And also, I think there's simply a lag before. Remember, the ECB has not been hiking rates for long. There's going to be a lag before the the effects of the tightening of financial conditions start to come through. Also, the surveys that the PMIs we had this morning offered a, a, a little bit of relief, a slight uptick, but they're still pointing to falls in, in Eurozone GDP. So I think we are still heading into a recession. There's less evidence in the Eurozone of a let up in price pressures. So I think the ECB is going to need to continue um, hiking. So it, it is generally a pretty, pretty bad picture um, from the Eurozone's perspective. Let's be optimistic for a second. Let's say China reopens, supply chains are normalized. How much of a boon does that give to Europe with both potentially lower uh, supply chain pressures and higher economic activity. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm, I'm not sure it does give a, a massive boost. Although during China's lockdowns, it's made huge efforts to keep to keep ports open, to keep industrial production going. So the implications for global supply chains haven't been as, as large as you might expect. Of course, with virus numbers still picking up in, in China, I think 80 cities now affected. It's, it's looking as bad as, as the first wave um, of the virus. So it seems very unlikely really now that we're going to see the, the reopening that people were hoping for ju just a couple of weeks ago. I, I look, Jennifer, just very quickly here. The turmoil is centered on a stunning headline, one of the great headlines of Bloomberg this year. The governor of the Bank of England modeling a two-year recession. How does he extricate himself from that? Does he amend that into next year? Um, well, yeah, it's a, it's, yes, if the data start to look um, persistently better, but uh, but I think on on the UK front, to um, retail sales, although, although they they rose a little bit in the in the latest data, they they've not um, reversed the previous falls, and I think there's more there's more to come. So I think probably um, Andrew Bailey is right to expect a, a fairly right. deep recession in the UK. We're expecting about a two percent peak to trough fall, which would be mm -hmm. which would be quite weak. But of, of course. If the data continue to surprise on the upside, then he there can recalibrate that and it would be well received. Optimism we need on a Wednesday. Thank you, Jennifer McEwen, so much at Capital um, Economics. I think we got to go into the Thanksgiving vamp. I'm looking over at our friends at Fox and they're doing Thanksgiving cocktails. You <laughs> You're know, we're, jealous. We can't top that. <laughs> and this is but where Tom Forget about Thanksgiving cocktails. Let's talk about the inflation that's out there. And I, I'll be honest, I don't think this is funny because it speaks 
to what's in our grocery stores. It's absolutely stunning, Lisa. Well, and it speaks to this idea of challenge, of difficulty, of souring sentiment, of what we might see at 10 a.m. today. It doesn't feel good when you're paying 69% more for stuffing mix, especially when I cook it. This, this goes on after Thanksgiving, not because of food costs, as we heard from Kona Hake yesterday, but because of petroleum costs, I'll, can you imagine Jeff Curry's view? What that's going to do to the grocery store? Well, yeah, I'm curious what that means to for, for sort of growth, given the concern that he doesn't see this necessarily crimping demand if you do have a weaker <clears throat> dollar. I do think, though, on a more positive note, and I can't believe I'm the one doing this, people are getting together, which is actually oh, awesome. Uh, and so even just, with oh, oil prices, no, come on, it's nice. I mean, I'm not, but I think it's really nice that people are prioritizing. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, just after being thought, with after thought said, Can I get Shake Shack seamless? Can we get, you know, get Shake Shack? That's a bargain. Is, that, is it to go? <laughs> I said, Yeah, we're going to save, yeah, that, save that's the money. Keen, there. Uh, keen Thanksgiving. Stay with us. Troy Gajewski, he knows how to cook the bird. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. <laughs> been a really well telegraphed bear market and it's been very orderly so far. The economy is probably going to be flat next year and that incorporates a couple of quarters of recession. We're looking at a recession here in the United States, shallow. Europe, I think, is already in recession and China's flatlining. What matters right now is when we're going to have inflation peaking and coming down steadily. It's pretty clear that goods prices are starting to normalize, but the market is also hoping that services prices will also normalize. If that's not the case, it's going to be a big problem. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keene, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance on Wednesday before Thanksgiving when the nation travels. We welcome all of you coast to coast on radio and television. Jonathan Farrell. Off for the holiday. What is that? Does he celebrate Thanksgiving? We could ask him when he gets back. When he gets back, it's scheduled something. I don't know. You know, Morocco played Croatia. I wasn't following it. And there's all this laughter, except it's not a funny day. It's a really serious news flow day. And let us begin not with a protest in China. and a current scheduled to join us. Not with BitDog. Shanali Basic with an update. But we're going to get right to it this morning. Futures up five. And Credit Suisse doesn't matter in Zurich. They are in crisis. They have reported that they are seeing withdrawals from their international wealth management unit which was the stalwart was the profit maker 10 percent of the assets out uh, going out in the past few months how much is this a precursor to a huge reshift that we've seen them kind of telegraph that could actually regain uh, investor confidence down 24 percent from the October glow and they breached through four Swiss francs per share. That is a stunning comment. And then following on just before we went to air, reported by Marion Haftermeyer in the Swiss uh, press, they have approval to go out and find $4 billion to dilute the present shareholders even further. This feels like it's been a slow burn until it wasn't slow anymore. This yeah, feels like, like it was sort of, uh, exactly. Think? I mean, it feels like there's been constant struggles, constant mishaps, constant, uh, you know, pain in the face of some of the cannibalization of their business from American oh. banks. And all of a sudden now it's, you know, make it or break it kind of uh, kind <clears throat> of plans. They've got to make uh, their investors feel good about it. Thanks for listening. Peter in Connecticut agrees with Bramo saying, yes, it was a slow burn. Thank you for emailing that in, uh, Peter. Good to see that uh, this morning. I mean, they got to do something. But the next question is, what do you do if at the margin, if you had 24 large, I mean, think Pharaoh. I mean, you know, Pharaoh money. If you had Pharaoh money in Credit Suisse, what would you do with the margin today? What would be the decision tree given 14 other opportunities in wealth management? Well, I don't that? get it. Oh, yeah. John just called in. He's saying that that's you and he doesn't have any stake whatsoever in Credit Suisse. Just wanted to clarify that. Thank there you. is this point, though, right <laughs> now of what do investors want to see? Who is left? Right. Saudi right. Arabian wealth management fund. I want to raise something else, Tom. Please. We've been talking all morning about how much more expensive Thanksgiving dinner is. Huge controversy. They, uh, the Farm Bureau putting out that the price of Thanksgiving dinner is going to be 20 percent more. The Biden administration's U.S. Department of Agriculture is saying it's only going to be 1 percent more and that that's sensationalist <clears throat> headlines. So just want to put that out there as sort of a correction. There are no Democrats at whole paycheck. That's what I would say. I, you've got to be kidding me. I, I'm with the Farm Bureau. I'm going through the store looking at 
basic stuff, you know, I only shop like once every three months, but basic stuff or something esoteric, some of this gluten-free bologna, you got to be kidding me, it's all to the moon. <laughs> it's true. But how much does <clears throat> this to really uh, highlight the tenuous moment that we're in where on one hand you can pick out, you could cherry pick where inflation is absolutely skyrocketing in other places. You can find right. instances in which it's not depending on where you shop and people are migrating to those places. We'll have to see. What else do you see this morning? The data check here. we got to do a brief here. Futures up four. Dow futures up 18. I don't have much going on on a Wednesday, except seriously, Credit Suisse south of four. Swiss franc per share. Lisa? What I'm watching today is a whole host of data. It is the data dump before Thanksgiving, consolidating three days into one. Uh, 8.30 a.m., we get initial jobless claims, durable goods orders, <clears> and at 9.45, S&P Global U.S. Manufacturing and Services PMIs. That follows on to what we got over in Europe. And then at 10 a.m., we get the University of Michigan sentiment for for November, as well as some new home sales for October. I'm very curious about consumer sentiment in light of the inflation that we're seeing, in light of some of the easing pressures in some areas while still seeing rents continuing to go up. Curious about how that plays out today. The group of seven nations are aiming to announce a price cap level for Russian oil. I don't really understand how exactly this is going to be only implemented. Only only Javier. <laughs> I'm just, uh, but we're understanding it's somewhere between 60 and $70. Russia mm -hmm. says it won't comply. The rest of the world says, yeah, you will. We'll find out more, and it's supposed to be enforced on December 5th. We shall see. 2 p.m., FOMC meeting minutes from the November 2nd meeting. This, to me, will be the big event of the day. How much is there a fissure among some of the consensus on the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee? How much do people start to say, <clears throat> wait a second, we could potentially cause more damage than help the economy by uh, continuing to yeah. raise rates for too far? Let's dive into it right now. And what we do is we don't kill two birds with one stone. We kill two turkeys with one stone, giving mm. you the Thanksgiving angle. We do that with Troy Gajewski, Chief Market Strategist, FS Investments, with a ton of experience of global Wall Street and New York Wall Street. Troy, before we get to your 60-40 comments, I want to talk to you about the state of hedge funds, given the stunning year we've had. How is 80-20, 2-20 doing? How are they doing this year? Yeah, so it depends on the strategy, Tom. I mean, it's actually been a very good year for multi-strategy solutions, whether they're Daily 40 Act or whether they're the classic QP structures. Um, there's been big dispersion across markets, yes. particularly if you look at rates versus currency, or you look at uh, trade opportunities like shorting uh, mortgages versus treasuries. So that's been a very attractive place to be. Um, systematic trend followers have also had a very strong year. Uh, there's been huge trends, as you know, whether it's the dollar or commodities or rates moving higher. Right. Um, and, and the strategies that struggled the most, of course, have been the growth-oriented long-short equity strategies that, you know, got a little too over their skis in terms of growth and go-go growth and perhaps got a little too involved in privates at elevated valuations. So, you know, in general, we think, you know, liquid multi-strategy solutions continue to make sense. Uh, you know, in, if you're going for income, you can look at things like FSCO, which we recently listed, which has income plus right. uh, appreciation potential that trades at a discount to NAV. Um, so lo lots to do in the hedge fund space, lots to do in the alternative space. And when you look at 6040 in the heart of your note, we've had a lot of different conversations of bond price up, yield down. Is the big shock next year that 6040 comes back with a vengeance? Yeah, so coming back with the vengeance would be a very strong term. I, I think one of our major themes, you know, our major theme for this year has been protect capital, don't be a hero, be in the northwest quadrant, the efficient frontier, right? Accept lower risk and either get a total return from income or through multi-strategy solutions. As we move through this cycle, uh, the next theme over the next several years will be, you know, cash flow is king in that you don't need price appreciation to make a reasonable return. As long as you don't have a horrific uh, recession where default rates skyrocket, your loss adjusted yield on cash flow should be pretty attractive. So that doesn't mean it's time to dramatically ramp up risk or, or rotate back aggressively in the 60-40. What it means is if you're going to accept risk in your portfolio and be in that Northeast quadrant, make sure you're doing it in strategies that have ample income and that can provide a buffer and also give you positive convexity if next year turns out better uh, than we think it will. So where does Bitcoin fit in, considering that you were bullish on the asset class not so long oh, ago? Oh, you are so cruel. Yeah, well, the look, hey, so again, Lisa, we've talked about this many times, right? Bitcoin is the most cyclical asset on the planet. It goes through meteoric bull markets like it did in 2021. Um, eventually, as demand exhausts itself, 
uh, supply is inelastic to price, right? So whether Bitcoin's at a million dollars or a dollar, 900 come out a day. And that's the reason you have these huge cycles. So there's really two approaches to owning crypto. And when we talk about crypto, we Bitcoin specifically, either have a tiny allocation in your overall asset uh, mix, ride the, the higher highs and higher lows, or trade the cycle. But clearly, as the Fed continues to tighten monetary policy, um, any directionally long asset is going to have a much more challenging environment well, than it did in 2021. Hold on a second, Troy, because what you're saying right now challenges the sort of existential angst that you hear across the board of people saying Bitcoin's done, it's all a Ponzi scheme, forget about it. And we've heard that from the likes, even of Neil Kashkari of the Federal Reserve. How much are you pushing back against that, saying this is here to stay? And are you among those tracking when there could be a good entry point, not necessarily bailing with all uh, get out? Yeah, look, look, so, I mean, it's same as it ever was, right? Like, Bitcoin has incredible cycles. Uh, you know, meteoric gains, whether it's 64x or 32x or 8x in the last cycle, and then 70 to 80% drawdowns. But it always survives because of the strength of the network. Um, so we certainly think Bitcoin will be around for the long haul, uh, but it's very, very volatile. Um, and, you know, most of what's gone on here recently is just bad actors in the space. It really doesn't speak to the negativity or, or negatively reflect on uh, Bitcoin itself. It more uh, reflects negatively on some of the actors that were attracted to the asset class, uh, which is a, a incredibly unfortunate and, and just calls for the fact that we need more regulation, without a doubt. Troy Gasky, thank you so much with FS Investments there on 2 and, and 20. I misspoke there and uh, the banner was my fault wrong. I made a mistake. That's my, that's my Thanksgiving mistake, folks. 2% and 20% payout on hedge funds and also, of course, on his investment view forward with the FS in investments as well. Pharaoh never would have done that. You were ruthless in your Bitcoin questions. What, I ask you. Did Just I ask ruthless. him about Bitcoin? No, really? and, and his view as well. Well, his view isn't ruthless. It's fascinating, and it really highlights that there are people that come in and buy Bitcoin. And that's what we're seeing. People are not necessarily bailing. They're not liquidating everything. It's not going to zero across the board, regardless of FTX, which is interesting. It's why we haven't seen more contagion. This is the broader market story. Why have we not seen bigger fallout See from the fact her, that there's a big... Her voice, it's like at the Thanksgiving table when the Bram, when Abramowitz and the Keen family are together, is your voice changes. To what? When you're lecturing me on Bitcoin. <laughs> Do you know how I, mean, I feel about this? Well, I know that you think that it's all ridiculous, but there are a lot of people who don't, which is the reason well, why I you're not he, seeing people. Troy really... was cogent, and as you say, he stated the case for being opportunistic given 20000 to 16000 And there's a stark difference in view between those who are going to be opportunistic and those who are saying it's the end of an era and end of an industry that grew right. out of extraordinary monetary policy. Citigroup. They publish on John Deere. Mr. Thane says simply, forget about PCAG. Revenues with a big surprise. Up, up, up on John Deere. Citigroup enthused on agriculture forward. Stay with us on Wednesday before Thanksgiving. We didn't mention Morocco, Croatia. We didn't. I think we tried. Go there. I think it we tried, but fails. we failed. <laughs> Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In Chesapeake, Virginia, a shooter opened fire in a Walmart Tuesday night. Police say six people were killed. The shooter is also dead, although authorities aren't sure how he died. At least five people were wounded. Chesapeake is Virginia's second largest city and is located next to Norfolk and Virginia Beach. The top judges in the UK have thrown out Scotland's latest bid for independence. The Supreme Court ruled unanimously that a second referendum would have to be approved by the British government. Now that thwarts nationalist leader Nicola Sturgeon's plan for a vote next year. Bloomberg has learned that the European Union is discussing capping the price of Russian crude oil at between $65 and $70 a barrel. The group of seven is also involved in the talks. UEW and EU ambassadors are meeting today with the aim of approving the cap mechanism and a proposed price level. Credit Suisse is warning that it will report a loss of up to $1.6 billion for the fourth quarter. Clients pulled as much as $88 billion of their money from the bank in the first few weeks of that quarter. The underscored concerns over restructuring efforts after years of scandal. Manhattan's Upper Fifth Avenue is now the most expensive retail district in the world. That's according to a survey by commercial property firm Cushman & Wakefield. Fifth Avenue beat out last year's number one, Hong Kong Sim Sha Sui District. Rents in Hong Kong plummeted due to COVID curbs and restrictions on visitors. 
Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Surveillance. Good morning, everyone. Lisa Bramitz and Tom Keen. Seriously, John Farrell off for a, a, a good rest, a good deserved rest as well. We're making a lot of jokes about it, but I went back and forth with John uh, yesterday. He had some good things on Saudi Arabia and um, uh, the, the huge upset with Argentina back 20 years to Senegal and uh, France. 20 years. Is, he, is the opinion of Mr. Farrow. Well, it was a huge upset, but the most amazing thing, Lionel Messi, the star of Argentina, <clears throat> is an ambassador to Saudi Arabia. So how awkward is that? It's un-American. Well, know, it's not. It's, it's Saudi Arabia it. and Argentina. It's not American. We digress right now. We'll do this with politics with Amory Horton on a deserved rest after uh, the G20 uh, meetings in Bali. And it is an honor to speak to someone, the third largest producers of Turkey in the world, Minnesota taking the top uh, notch. But Arkansas, with their leadership on poultry, which means there's only one person we can talk to, French Hill. Here's the reality, folks. You can go out and get a prairie turkey for $119 for the beast, or you can go to French Hill's Walmart and pony up for the organic beast to $21.80. What was the choice, French Hill? The fancy organic beast, or did you go to Bentonville, Arkansas? Tom, Lisa, good morning. We went straight Walmart yesterday, but the price tag was still shocking. But we're getting ready around our house for 14 tomorrow. So Walmart was our partner in crime. I will not mince words, and let's get serious, French Hill. It is a time of immense American tumult in the justice wing, the executive wing, the legislative wing, and everybody affected differently by this inflation. What is the prescription of a Republican majority in the House. Well, Tom, this has been a persistent and stubborn problem for over two years. Uh, you and I have talked about the origins many times from too loose monetary policy and continuing to be too accommodative in, in the end of 2020, and then an abundant amount of spending, some $5 trillion of, of extra spending green lighted by Joe Biden. So, Look, the Fed is now doing what it needs to do, which is to raise rates and battle inflation, but it's up against uh, fiscal uh, and regulatory policy. So Republicans want to control federal spending, go back to pre-pandemic spending levels, prioritize spending, roll back regulatory burdens that makes it harder to hire somebody or harder to unleash American energy. So I think you'll see us work to curtail spending, lighten the regulatory footprint, make the uh, personal tax cuts in the Trump Tax Cuts and Jobs Act permanent. These will be some of the legislative ideas that we'll bring forth next spring. How much do we have a leader from the Republican Party? Do you have someone who you think supports the views that you put forward in terms of how to curtail inflation best? Well, you know, Lisa, we worked uh, for uh, 18 months inside the House Republican Conference to develop ideas across the conference and make sure these were ones that were supported by a majority of our members. And I think this tax, regulatory, and spending agenda, uh, that view is all shared uh, by House Republicans under the leadership of Kevin McCarthy, who I believe uh, will be the next Speaker of the House in January. Are you going to be supporting uh, Donald Trump for another term as president? You know, I saw where Donald Trump got in the uh, in the race, uh, but we have so many talented people in the Republican Party that are between 45 and 65 years old. And I've been saying for a couple of years since the 2020 election, I'm ready for generational change uh, for our leadership to run for president. And I think that's true for well, the Democrats, too. I think Americans are mm -hmm. looking for new candidates from both parties. Oh, come on, French Hill. You're going to have a Thanksgiving of 24 people. You're cooking three birds from Walmart. I get the whole thing. And full disclosure, folks, there are no Democrats at the, fr at the Hill household uh, here tomorrow. <laughs> You've got a new Republican Party where a GOP establishment like you, is trying to find its footing, its grounding against the supporters of the former president. 
What's that going to look like over the next six months? What exactly does the GOP establishment do? How do they move forward? Well, I think uh, being the uh, House Republicans will control the only modest part of government. I think we need to work together and have a consensus on the priorities of improving American security, for example, on the border, (laughs) improving the economy and fighting inflation, and uh, working together. And I think we'll do that in the House. We'll have those discussions in the House, but we'll have consensus going forward. That's what we have to do if we're going to counter the, the Biden administration. Uh, let's look through the microcosm of agricultural production. I mentioned earlier, folks, the leadership of Arkansas in poultry production and certainly uh, world class in production of turkey as well. Give us the labor update you're hearing from your business leaders directly in poultry, say Tyson's and the rest, or around them, the huge Arkansas ecosystem that supports poultry manufacture. Still, there's a shortage of uh, qualified labor up and down that supply chain in agriculture, uh, and there's no doubt about that. Uh, The innovation is still there. The expansion is still there. The financing is still there. I've talked to several producers in the last few weeks that are planning on uh, expanding their operations in 2023, but labor remains a a challenge. French Hill, thank you so much. We'll be over there. We'll try to get there by 12 noon for Detroit Lions as well. Congressman French Hill. I'll bring stuff in. All are welcome. Uh, C- Congressman French Hill uh, celebrating Thanksgiving. What did he say, 25 people, something like that? <laughs> it's going to be fun. He doesn't I have a New the... York apartment. Yeah. He's got like 8,000 square feet. The dining room is bigger than yours or my own. I love Thanksgiving right? conversations. What do you think will be the theme? And last year it was Bitcoin, right? That was sort of the, the sort of hot topic at Thanksgiving. Now it's what? They always put me, I mean, even today, whoever the oldest person in the room is, grandma or grandpa is like, 87 years old and needs help, and I'm sitting next to them making light conversation. <laughs> You're looking forward to this, aren't you? I guess you'll be ordering out from Shake Shack as well. No, no. We're, we're uh, you know, full disclosure, we, we celebrate with Mr. Dacos. We're very fortunate to get a chair at Benoit, sold out. I mean, it's, it's just great. And the only thing I have to do is to get down on my knees and say in French, please cook the damn bird, because the French undercook everything. I'd like to I'm see like, you please. say that, even the uh, beginning of that. Ah, uh, s'il vous plaît, <laughs> cooker, <laughs> <All right>. poulet. <laughs> okay. Not before we stop and just insulting all uh, our French watchers, I will say that this this sort of uh, missive from the USDA is interesting to me. The sort of battle of the sources in terms of just how inflationary oh, McKee this Thanksgiving on this. McKee will be. with reporting. Yeah, McKee with reporting that the USDA is saying that Americans who want a turkey will be able to get one. This according to the Biden administration. And we're looking right now at grocery prices, mm-hmm. uh, according to this report, only uh, being a 1% to 6% increase year over year. So. I don't buy it. I, I'm just anecdotally, I am shocked at what I see in the grocery store. I don't. The, buy it. the distinction here, as we heard from French Hill, he went to Walmart to go grocery shopping. Yes, A lot of true, people who true. previously went to Whole Foods, who previously went some of these other places, are no, going this is to true. Walmart, well which said. is the reason why yeah. it's gaining share in the grocery uh, grocery section. You're seeing a downshifting, even among people who are uh, mm. of more means, and that perhaps is one of the keys of this entire thing. He was cycle. out doing a fundraiser in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I jest. We oh, didn't, boy. We didn't really no. mean that. No, we didn't. What we're following, seriously, folks, on a Wednesday of non-news, no, that is not true. It's not news. Credit Suisse with huge withdrawals from their wealth management shocks the Swiss banking system. They get approval at the same time in an emergency meeting to raise another $4 billion equity. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Savannah, good morning. Let's do a data check. Really haven't done one all morning. John Farrell emails in and says, do a data check. He's starving for a data check. Futures up four. John, Dow futures up 11 points here fractionally, but green on the screen. All in all, the VIX, uh, really a huge day yesterday for the VIX. Call it a 24 level in under 22 as well. We'll have to see where that goes uh, with some of the enthusiasms we see out there on a holiday uh, lengthened work week. Yield 
a little bit of a move higher, 4.54% on the two-year. Ten-year yield, 3.77%. Two-cent spread is my news, negative yeah. 78 basis points. Let's stop there, Lisa. I'm sorry, that's a big deal. It's Further a short inversion. term. It's short term. The Fed's going to keep raising rates and keep it there. And we're going to hear perhaps more on that with meeting minutes later today. On the longer end, people are looking at perhaps a souring outlook, but not necessarily the hard landing that some people were expecting. What I'm looking at, some specific stocks uh, that really caught my attention, dear, Please. you mentioned. And this, I think is important. Deer shares popping yep. after reporting better than expected earnings. Uh, the shares had been up as much as almost 8%, now up just 4%, but still, the outlook is good. And how much is this really mm. a situation with a company that's navigated well, and how much is it they're in the sweet spot for agriculture right. at a time when prices are going up? We talk about Thanksgiving. To strategy and your need to make money because you're buying the organic bird at $119 uh, per bird. Let's do that. Did you finish with your equity... Thing no, I was going to mention a couple of going, names. Keep going. Keep going. Right. I don't uh, need to interrupt. I just was HP, enthused. HP Inc., which makes all Hewlett sorts of Packard. personal uh, computing devices, Hewlett said that it would cut as many as 6,000 jobs yesterday. And this uh, is sort of building on the tech cuts. Those shares up about 2.5 percent, uh, minus but a bit. I'm glad you feature this different, though, than the panic of OMG. We got something wrong. This is a more three-year strategic Cut, Strategic right? being key, yeah. and the reward that you're seeing in markets shows that that rationalizing is definitely gaining steam across uh, the entire tech industry. And Nordstrom just shows the tale of two retails, down uh, almost 8% those shares after uh, reporting worse than expected wow. earnings. And this, to me, is interesting. Gross margin not doing it. And this is really how much we're seeing the winners and the losers in retail. It's, it, and again, uh, I think we, it's been great on that. And, and of course, the polarity there is Target really struggling and others doing better. Yeah. How, mean, much how much is this execution? How much is it execution? How much is it macro? <clears throat> As I was saying, you need to pay for the bird and you do that with currency trades. Eric Nelson joins us now. Currency strategy in London with Wells Fargo. Eric, thank you so much for joining us and the specificity of your against consensus, resilient and strong dollar comes over to cable where you initiate a trade, folks. This is how it works for pros. At 119 sterling, down to a weaker sterling, 114, and you put in a stop at 121.25. Essentially, if you get the trade wrong, you're going to go out at 121.25. Explain how often, Eric, you have to use a stop loss. Does that happen frequently? Every time, Tom. i uh, got to manage the risk. And it's look, it's a very volatile market. Uh, you certainly have to set some tight stop, uh, relatively wide stops, uh, unless you want to get stopped out very quickly with the volatility where it is. But you look at sterling and uh, uh, close to 120, especially, I think this is a very attractive risk toward here, even with a lot of people right. starting to say, oh, well, the, the dollar long trade is over. Uh, this, to, to us, this is really the, the place you want to focus our attention when thinking about right. dollar going up. Let's go type one, type two, not your enthusiasm for the dollar, but what do they get wrong in screaming weak dollar? Well, there's a little bit too much focus placed on this one CPI print. And there's also a, a question of, okay, so the energy crisis has stopped getting worse. Uh, you know, China has, in, in some sense, stopped getting worse. Um, you know, it's not reopening at the pace we thought it was. Um, but also the Fed has also stopped getting even more aggressive on a sequential basis. When we think about the level, though, of relative growth, relative yields, the dollar is still very attractive, Tom. Uh, you know, U.S. versus Europe, U.S. versus U.K., uh, still screams dollar higher from my perspective. So putting aside some short-term choppiness around the holiday, you still think dollar rallies into year-end. What about next year, Eric? It seems like the new consensus is you're going to see a peak in the first half of next year and then some pretty steady weakness into the second half. Do you agree? Yeah, Lisa, I think we – I certainly could see a situation where the dollar does peak out next year. The question is, what gets us there? And, and, and a lot of the arguments I'm hearing are not particularly convincing. Now, there's a soft landing argument, which I think is, you know, maybe a little bit far-fetched. But should it happen, I think there's absolutely a case for, for dollar to go lower. But I do sort of worry, you know, in a situation where maybe we see a milder recession in the U.K. and Europe um, and, and the U.S. Um, kind of muddles through, that relative rates and growth story to me is still so compelling. I don't see that changing materially enough to really move the dollar lower materially, at least in the first half of next year. So it's at least an H2 story. And even then, 
I'm not fully convinced at this point. How much is positioning against your view? In other words, how much could you actually see a boon just simply because people are moving away from the strong dollar call and really starting to bet a little bit more on some sort of weakening? Well, Lisa, I like to say this has been the, the least loved dollar rally in history. Uh, throughout the year, I've gotten, we've gotten tons of pushback on the dollar bullish call. Uh, leverage funds have largely sat out the rally if you look at positioning. Asset managers have, have really cleared out a lot of their dollar long positions. So if I look at positioning as it stands right now, it's very much, much more neutral than it was at the beginning of the year. And overall, if anything, maybe leans short dollars in some pairs. So I think the consensus is moving toward uh, the sort of dollar weaker story, which to me signals that positioning actually mm -hmm. is uh, a better placed for dollar to go higher here. Eric, I got sucked into buying the organic hoity-toity turkey. I desperately need big figure moves now. Where's the big figure win in EM right now? Where's the trade? That, I mean, do you go Argentina because they lost to Saudi Arabia? Where's the EM, where's the EM pair that's going to uh, make some money here in the next six weeks? Well, a lot of it is going to hinge on, on China, I think, Tom. And, and if we do really see... Um, so, some improvement on, on the China side. It, Dollar Korea has been one that has moved an absolute ton this year. Um, the issue is I don't, I don't think we're going to get that improvement for uh, at least uh, six weeks. So I think continuing to focus on on LATAM, um, if we do see, you know, if, if I'm wrong and the dollar uh, actually goes the other way here, uh, some of these, these Latin American pairs, um, even despite some recent moves, probably have more room to run given the carry. Eric, as I read all of the notes for the year ahead next year, I'm struck by how many people believe in a soft landing. And it doesn't mean necessarily that we're going to avoid recession, but it will be shallow, it'll be short, and then we'll emerge on the other side somewhere around September of next year. It seems like this is becoming increasingly consensus. Do you push back on that? Yeah, it, it's a little bit hard, especially if I look outside the U.S., Lisa. I look at the housing market situation and some of these other developed market economies. Now, the U.S. Is, is certainly looking a little bit precarious, but Canada, uh, Australia, some of these other markets are very precarious. we got to worry about uh, the Chinese property sector, which uh, everyone seems to think is, is pretty much fully contained. Um, there's a lot of risks that are still out there. And I'm not saying that the, the soft landing can't happen, but I think we've had one or two um, you know, good uh, CPI reports, and people have, have been a little bit too quick to, to extrapolate from that and think we can actually emerge from this unscathed. Eric, now for the really important question. As an expat in London, are you celebrating Thanksgiving? Are there other expats? Is there a Thanksgiving vibe? Uh, not as much as I would uh, I would hope. I imagine it feels uh, somewhat similar to uh, July 4th around here. Uh, I think the World Cup is really what's, what's uh, taking everyone's attention, though, and uh, certainly right. looking forward to U.S. England on Friday. Eric Nelson, a safe answer. With Wells Fargo, he'll keep <laughs> yeah, his job at least fair. Monday as well. But seriously, folks, there, it's a really, it's not an outlier call. I'm not going to say that much, but it's a very articulate call pushing against a consensus of flat to weaker dollars. Dollars Good a to trade to always get wrong. I mean, how many times have we headed into a year with people having conviction about the dollar that <clears throat> is turned on its head pretty quickly? It's hard to game out because of all of the variables, and we're not even tracking okay. interest rate uh, differentials anymore. Do I get bonus points on a Wednesday factor. for insulting all of France? I mean, everyone's emailed in but Lagarde and Macron. Oh, yeah? What are they saying? <laughs> They're very, they thought I insulted by saying that, that sometimes the, the poulet is undercooked a little bit. I like it. I like it more cooked. I thought that they were offended by your accent. Yeah. So you like well, you like dry turkey? I don't like it dry, but I just like it cooked, like medium well. I don't know. What do you? I don't know how you call a turkey. I mean, I'm making it on this. What I do like is Alan Ducasse's poached pears, pear sorbet, and chocolate sauce. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're really you're really commuting with the uh, inflation story, and Alan Alain Ducasse uh, definitely uh, not very relatable. No, it's, it's there. It's Thanksgiving. And again, we should mention travel. We really haven't done the airline racket. It's going to be nuts again. Yeah, probably. And this is some area that's completely booned. I mean, this is the thing about this inflationary moment is that, you know, you have companies oh. that are reporting negative earnings and then you go to the airplane uh, industry and they can't <clears throat> charge enough. You can't afford uh, it. They're packed. Maybe Jeff Curry uh, dovetails into Jennifer McCune earlier. Yeah, but some of the data in the how grim is the united kingdom seriously yeah, it's it's and really jennifer McCune, of capital economics folks saying you know what it's really maybe not all that bad 
That's well, the first whisper I've heard. Although we did see that with the, da the data overnight, the PMI data out of Europe, that it wasn't as bad as people had expected. It came in. It's still in recession territory, but better than, um, than anticipated. Is it sustainable, right? Is this a one kind of one-time event because oil prices have not been going up as quickly and because of the gas stockpiles. Right. Can they contain this? You know what's amazing? Dennis Gartman emails in, good morning, Mr. Gartman. Lovely to hear from you on the day before Thanksgiving. And what's amazing from him, he carves the beast from the lower right to the upper left. Thank it's, you. It's, it's, I appreciate from the, that. From the upper left to the lower right. He's short turkey here. He carves a beast in the way of a chart. Well, Only Gartman would do that. Carving charts the way he would do a turkey you know. um, or, or vice versa. I'm curious to see where <clears throat> we go with the slew of data. I mean, how nice is the Federal Reserve? Seriously here. In 45 minutes. minutes. <laughs> in 45 and then minutes. And at 2 p.m., people are going to be getting ready for the Thanksgiving and pouring over the uh, meeting minutes for the Federal Reserve, including you, Tom. 40 minutes economic data here. There's a lot of it out, durable goods. And of course, uh, we see on claims as well uh, before Thursday and also Germany, Japan. Bloomberg yeah. surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. For the second time in just a few days, there's been a mass shooting in the U.S. This time it took place in Chesapeake, Virginia, where a shooter opened fire in a Walmart Tuesday night. Police say six people were killed, at least five others wounded. The gunman is also dead, although police aren't sure how he died. Disgraced founder of the collapsed crypto exchange FTX has apologized to staff in a letter. Sam Bankman-Fried outlined what he called a crash in collateral from $60 billion to $9 billion. So far, bankruptcy proceedings have depicted FTX as a business with unusual lax documentation and financial controls. While it's a major blow to Donald Trump, the Supreme Court has cleared the way for a House committee to get six years of the former president's tax returns. It's a resounding triumph for Democrats after a three-year battle. Still, they have only a few weeks left to review the returns before Republicans take control of the House. There were violent protests at Apple's main iPhone making, making plant in China. Now, hundreds of workers at the Foxconn factory battled security personnel after almost a month of tough restrictions intended to quash a COVID outbreak. Now, according to witnesses, the protests started overnight over unpaid wages and fears of spreading infection. And the world's largest maker of agricultural machinery expects a profit surge to a record next year. Deere is projecting net income for the fiscal year that beat Wall Street estimates. That's after posting better than expected fourth quarter earnings. Deere has benefited from the rise in farmers' incomes. Global news, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Inflation became a lot uh, more pervasive, more entrenched, and also the pressures have intensified after the war. Monetary policy has to continue to be decisive. It has to uh, do what monetary policy has to do in order to get out of this situation. From Portugal, Alvaro Pereira, really an informed interview yesterday about the vector lower on real GDP growth, the vector higher on inflation, the readjustment of OECD yesterday. Lisa, I thought that was a really important interview. Especially because they do see uh, not necessarily a global recession, but really slow growth, especially led by the developed world. Uh, time is precious. Let's get right to it. He's been with us daily on the story of his China and occur and joins from Hong Kong, Bloomberg Chief Asia Economics Correspondent. The video is stark, and uh, and I would suggest the video changes the dialogue of the politics of Beijing. If we look at the Apple manufactory in China, it is at least protest. It is at least people standing around with the car, the the police cars, etc. And the overwhelming size of Foxconn, how big it is. How does Beijing respond to the video of protest in China? Well, this is pretty rare, Tom, and I think a lot of analysts are saying it speaks to the frustrations on the ground now in China in terms of the ongoing COVID zero policy. In this particular case, as you mentioned, it's it's Apple's main iPhone plant in China. We saw through the videos 
those uh, workers breaking out from their dormitories, clashing with the staff. The complaints were said to be the complaints were said to be over salaries and over fear of of cap, of catching the virus. Foxconn themselves have said that the factory is working and back in operational order tonight. But the point of it all is that it is unusual. It's a rare glimpse. You know, we always speak about how can we capture what's going on on the ground in terms of sentiment in China. Well, this is something that's come through the social media chain. Other posts that express frustration are towards COVID zero do get censored on on a on a regular basis. Uh, and I think it speaks to the complications that China is trying to do here. They're trying to, right. on the one hand, control COVID. On the other hand, they want to allow their economy to breathe. Uh, our conversation, I believe, yesterday or the day before was 800 miles northwest of Hong Kong, relatively deep into China, into Sichuan. Do we have any reporting of other protests in a very large China, or is it just visible protests around the three great cities? It's mostly, sometimes it's leaks out on social media, Tom. There have been other protests or at least expressions of objections to COVID-0 leaking out on social media in recent days, but they're getting censored. And that's the only real kind of gauge of sentiment that we have. Obviously, the official and the state press aren't going to really carry it. What we saw at the Foxconn plant on that video that our colleagues worked on today, that's obviously pretty pretty rare and unusual to have it on that scale. It has happened in the past at some plants, but this is pretty unusual. And as I said to you, it doesn't just speak to the frustrations on the ground. We're starting to see the policymakers getting nervous. We had news tonight before I came on that the central bank is going to try and put more money into the economy to make sure that it doesn't... Uh, to make sure that at least has some support going into the crucial winter months that are coming up, and that will be a big test, of course, of COVID zero. The problem with that is everybody knows the economy doesn't need more money at the moment. Nobody wants to borrow. It's all because of COVID zero weighing on the consumer on one side, and of course the real estate slump weighing on consumers on the other side. Well, and this really highlights also the policymakers on the on the official side, local policymakers that are kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. They're being challenged with increasing growth and trying to focus more on economic momentum, and at the same time, it's still tasked with clamping down on COVID. And it seems like that sort of angst was underpinning what happened at the Foxconn factory. How much are you starting to care? pushback from local officials saying, we can't do this. It's a paradox. Well, you're absolutely right, Lisa. Uh, you've summed it up completely correctly there. There's a bit of having your cake and eating it going on. There's, there was something of a, a shift in COVID strategy in recent weeks, which broadly speaking said, look, try and avoid, ma avoid mass lockdowns and broad restrictions. Be more targeted, close off blocks and areas, and allow the economy to stay on, on its feet. But like you're saying, obviously, that's very difficult to pull off. The local officials are faced with, well, do we try and do that and allow the virus to spread, or, or do we throw a blanket over their whole city uh, and suffocate the virus? But to, to the latter end of your point, I don't know how much scope they have for pushback with the central government. I mean, the central government is saying they're delegating, we're giving the responsibility to you, you can manage the virus best, but I'm not sure any local authority would like to see the virus spread out of control. Uh, you know, this side of the Chinese New Year, which comes early, it comes in January, and of course, then ahead of the big NPC in March, where President Xi gets crowned. Uh, there are certainly lots of political tension still surrounding COVID in China. It strikes me there's also quite a bit of confusion around just how much the COVID strategy has changed, right? We heard a slight shift in tone from Xi Jinping, and yet at the same time, the COVID clampdowns are still occurring. Do you have a sense of how much things have actually changed? I mean, they've made tweaks. We do know that tweaks on the quarantine on arrival, for example, they've lifted the flight bans. Uh, they've lifted, they've made changes to the testing requirements, at least for those coming into the international border. On the ground, as we were saying, it's meant to be more targeted. They don't want to have mass lockdowns like they did in Shanghai a few months ago. But, you know, the real politique comes back to what authority really is right. going to allow the virus, the virus to spread while. That comes with significant <clears throat> political, political cost. And uh, very quickly here, the great James Fallows in The Atlantic 10 years ago wrote a brilliant, informative essay on Foxconn then. What does Foxconn actually look like in 2022? Well, it's a powerful company. It's a huge employer. Uh, it's, as we said, it's home to the biggest Apple iPhone plant right now in the world. So it's at the center of global supply chains. It's at the center of the global consumer story. Uh, and they have said that their plant is back up and running tonight. They've said they've got it functioning again. So I think it's very central to the China industrial and the global consumer story, Tom.
And to thank you so much daily with us. I think end of tomorrow we will not bother you. It's just possible <laughs> on Thanksgiving we will not bother bother and to Kern. I saw one statistic this morning, Lisa, a labor force of 200,000 at Foxconn. I mean, can, I, I don't think we have, we, I can't frame that. I, I know I can't frame An entire that. ecosystem, an entire city devoted yeah. to manufacturing four out of five of the uh, main iPhones. You've mentioned this before, and I think it's an important point, this idea that uh, it's not just hard for Apple to withdraw from, from China because of its reliance on the Foxconn factories, et cetera, but because it sells a lot of the iPhones to China, right? I mean, it's a big business for them. When you get this type of disruption, you do wonder at what point you start to get some product shortages that cause Apple to rethink some of the production lines while also not angering Chinese officials at a time when that's a huge market for them. Not mentioned today, Lisa, really, really important. All of a sudden, we become really accommodative on the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index. It has been, I think, underreported. It's walking in the other direction for Chairman Powell from restriction, yeah. tighter out there. Maybe and with the equity markets up, that helps. Much more accommodative with the statistic of today, a negative 0. 0.50 standard deviations. For Global Wall Street, that's of note. Yeah, year-end melt-up that uh, I know a lot of banks are oh, actually I like that. using. For, well, I this is that? what you've been talking about. You've been saying you can't bet against it. <clears throat> banks are using this opportunity to also get rid of some of the debt, the hung bridge loans yeah. and things like that on their books. They're trying to clean house ahead of whatever might happen I had year. a recollection Japan could surprise Germany. I don't think it's like a layup for Germany. It's I mean, after Argentina and Saudi Arabia, nothing seems like it's probably yeah. a I mean, layup. We'll give you team coverage oh, yeah. here, World Cup coverage. <laughs> we'll do that with the Andrew Sheets of Morgan Stanley next. Stay with us. is inflation to start to come off the boil. The Fed you know, still has some way to go in terms of raising interest rates, but that those interest rate hikes are probably going to be smaller than what we've seen. If the Fed just pauses in January and February, not necessarily you know, have to cut. That's kind of the, the green light for the equities. Monetary policy has to continue to be decisive. We still have you know, the uncertainty of a, of a Fed policy era. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Andrew, how's it going? It's Lisa. Oh, hey, Lisa. Hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Are you hosting this uh, Thanksgiving? Uh, I, uh, I am. I am not. I am. I'm going over to a, a, a Thanksgiving, so that uh, that takes a certain level of the pressure off. How about you? How about yourself? No, I'm not hosting. Thank goodness. <laughs> 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 John, uh, Andrew, we had teachers conferences yesterday for the 15 year old and the major topic was Brown RISD. Ah, okay, don't, very good. Don't think it's going to happen, but we spent a lot of time in Providence. Uh, well, yeah. uh, how, how was Providence this time of year? Well, I don't know. No, I wasn't in Providence, but I mean, talking about her going to Brown RISD double Morning. major, but. Don't think very, it's going to Very happen. good. Uh, well, uh, very good. I very think good. we're looking at British school. She's moving in with the Sheets family in three years. looking for is inflation to start to come off the boil. The Fed you know, still has some way to go in terms of raising interest rates, but that those interest rate hikes are probably going to be smaller than what we've seen. If the Fed just pauses in January and February, not necessarily you know, have to cut. That's kind of the, the green light for the equities. Monetary policy has to continue to be decisive. We still have you know, the uncertainty of a, of a Fed policy era. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz.
It's the Thanksgiving data dump and a bit of an earnings data dump as well. It is Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz for Bloomberg Surveillance. Welcome back uh, on this pre-Thanksgiving day. And uh, Tom Keen, we see that John is off uh, on a well-deserved day off. But right now, it is beast. not. Oh, yeah, cooking the beast. Yeah. We're trying to as well. It is a beast of information. It is not a slow day. It's not it a actually slow Wednesday. should be a Absolutely. slow Wednesday. It is not. We've got a whole host of data coming up here in about a half an hour. And then 2 p.m., Fed meeting minutes. Uh, what I would focus here right now is on stock selection. That's going to be the theme. It, it, folks, seriously, it's not a quiet Wednesday. Very unusual. And we can just generalize Credit Suisse down under four Swiss francs per share. As we've mentioned that story all through the hour. I think we've underplayed Lisa. John Deere, with the new price of 430 uh, maybe even 432 is up 48% oh, wow. from the July lows. It's not a moonshot. It doesn't look like Exxon. But we forget there is an industrial global America setting up for profit. I'm glad that you brought this up, the idea that we talk this macro talk with so many people who have these prognostications for what the world will do. And in the <clears throat> specific stock story, it is such a a story by story kind of yeah. situation where you have the likes of Nordstrom not doing so well, then you've got the likes of Macy's knocking it out of the park. You've got the likes of Gap even doing better than people expected. It's just a motley picture, and getting the right names yeah. might be more important than perhaps and understanding the macro trends. I'm as fault of this as any is anyone, and that you know we focus on global Wall Street, and that includes the soap opera Credit Suisse, but. Apple, it's so easy to talk about Apple. I have an Apple iPhone and Afterthought wants a new one. Apple, you know, I mean, I've got a John Deere Zamboni, which I use in Central Park, but, <laughs> you know, deck? a Zamboni. That's yeah, what no, I know what a Zamboni from. is. Okay, I thought you, you used it on your deck. No, I've yeah. got a John Deere Zamboni. It's really, really great, but mm. we don't talk enough about industrial America. Well, and, They're killing it. And this goes to Jeff Curry's point. We haven't necessarily invested Energy as well. in the old economy, and he was talking about how the bubbles of new technology, of new uh, of the new hot thing, typically uh, precede the increase in prices, the lack of investment that caused uh, some sort of inflationary boom of the 1970s and now today. How much are we also watching yeah. uh, what we're experiencing? And I do keep pointing to this at 2 p.m., the road ahead for the Fed. I know you don't like gaming this out, mm. but how much is that the important story to watch rather than the uh, company-specific types of stories? That you well, I'm going to go to the claims. I mean, I know claims have been boring. You're going you're to go Fed minutes here, some, several, few, and all that. I'm going to go to what we're going to see in 27 minutes here, and it is now the time where we begin to see what the gloom crew feels is the lift up and lift layoffs. Most of the guests have pushed, including Congressman Hill, have pushed against the idea that layoffs are germane, tangible, countable. We'll see with claims in 20 minutes. And right now we are seeing uh, some firings in the tech space, but other places we're actually seeing hiring, so we can get into that in a minute. Right now what I'm seeing is a lift. That end of the year melt up that you were talking about, never <clears> bet <throat> against the people okay. who are trying to really uh, game a performance heading into year end. The Nasdaq up two-tenths of a percent. Yields kind of range-bound. I mean, honestly, this has been a market that has been slow to really respond to uh, to news that really is more company specific, perhaps, oh, than it is. The macro. VIX is in 10 big figures in this mini rally we've had. 30.31 down to 21.67. This is a bull market no one loves. Is Mr. Nelson from Wells Fargo said it's dollar resilience no one loves. But is it riding it just until it can't have any more steam? Go. And the reason why I ask this is because of what you pointed <clears throat> to, the 210 spread, this classic benchmark of recession. Typically when it inverts, you have a recession about uh, 12 to 18 months later. Right now it's the most inverted going back to 1981. How much can you actually be optimistic about the equity story when life of some of that kind of mm, negative tea leaves. I know you got to get to Andrew here, but I mean, right now it's a tough call for Bloomberg surveillance. We're in consultation in the control room, folks. Do we chat Germany, Japan, or Lions Bills tomorrow? It's a tough call. We'll let uh, Andrew Sheets uh, determine that later, but let's first uh, get to what the macro call is. And I really want to start with this concept of trying to parse out some broader story amid myriad individual uh, stories and pictures that are idiosyncratic in nature. Andrew Sheets, Chief Cross Asset Strategist at Morgan Stanley, who's been nailing it this year. Andrew, how difficult was it to come up with some sort of scenario, some sort of roadmap for 2023? Well, thanks. Since it's nice to be here with you. You know, I, I think the most striking thing about our outlook is that we are expecting <laughs> 2023 to look very different. You know, I think 2022 was a year marked by extremely expensive starting valuations, resilient growth, 
very high, surprisingly high inflation and then very hawkish policy. <clears throat> when we think about next year, you know, all those elements are somewhat different. Valuations are normalized. We think growth will be weaker, but inflation will be lower and policy will be a lot less hawkish. So, you know, I think that that's for 2023, a, a consistent story, but also a very different story than what we've just seen this year. Right now, people are talking about a first half that's really painful, a second half that's positive, the melt up in 2023. How much do you buy into this belief that we're going to get some sort of peak inflation leading to a sense of an end that will come around June, July of 2023? Yeah, so I, so I think if I look at our outlook, you, you really have some 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 competing forces, uh, good versus bad. I think on the good side, we're, we're, we are in the camp that the Fed will be early to pause. We think the last Fed hike is in January. We think inflation will come down at a pretty healthy clip over 2023, both things that are quite helpful. But we also think earnings have a lot of downside in the U.S. My colleague Mike Wilson is you know, more than 10 percent below consensus uh, for, for yeah. earnings uh, in, in 2023. And so we think those competing forces mean that you want to be focused right. for now on high quality fixed income and later on trying to be more bullish on it. And this is a really important question for global, uh, global Wall Street. With great respect, Andrew Sheets, for your shop and the legacy of Stephen Roach, you guys fight visibly like cats and dogs. It's wonderful to see the Morgan Stanley process. I have a huge respect for it, folks. What's a distinctive debate right now? What's the singular thing that you're arguing about at Morgan Stanley? So I, I think there are a few things. We're always we're always debating. Uh, there are always a number of things under debate. I think this idea that inflation comes down and will it finally come down in 2023? Inflation was very hard to forecast in 2022. We struggled with forecasting inflation. The Fed struggled with it. A lot of forecasters struggled with it. I think there are a lot of good reasons why inflation comes down in 2023, but I think it's something that clearly there's a lot of right. uh, doubt around, uh, uncertainty around, given how hard it was to forecast. And then also I think this question of, can the Fed really pause without reversing the progress that it's made in tightening financial conditions, right? Almost by definition, once it stops hiking, it's easing, and does that kind of work against everything right. the Fed's trying to achieve? So it's kind of how does it message that is, I think, a big debate. So then what do you and Alan Zentner make of the new accommodation witnessed in the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index moving from a negative one standard deviation to a negative 0.5 standard deviation, shockingly accommodative over, let's say, the last 20 days? Yeah, so I, I do think this is a challenge the Fed is going to have, and and we don't think you know we we forecast the lead the last Fed hike to be in January, but we don't think you know at that January <clears throat> meeting the Fed throws up its hands and says this is it you know we're we're done. We think the Fed will will hike in January, and then as inflation continues to moderate into the first quarter, they will just simply be on hold. They will monitor the situation. They will emphasize that that hiking works with a long and variable leg. And we've just had the fastest 12 month pace of hiking in 40 years. So it, right. it wants to see how that plays out. But but clearly, as you mentioned, that that easing of financial conditions is a is a challenge and I think is something the Fed takes quite seriously. Andrew Sheets, thank you so much for joining us this morning. An important conversation on this Wednesday. And again, I love the fractious nature of how Morgan Stanley makes a sausage. It's really uh, I, I just think absolutely original. Sometimes I miss it, folks, and I missed it this morning, and it's really good that we have listeners and viewers worldwide honest 24-7. Lisa, we were talking with French Hill of Arkansas and, of course, of Walmart in Bentonville, Arkansas, and I was completely remiss not to mention this horrific shooting with Congressman Hill. It's completely my fault, folks, and uh, I'm really upset about it, frankly. We should have brought up the issue of guns and mass shootings with a good gentleman from Arkansas. Especially because Walmart does sell guns. So will this yeah. change their policy? Also, we're just getting news uh, from the police uh, reporting that the Walmart shooter in Virginia was a company employee. Yeah. So we will bring you updates on that. But it raises this sort of polarizing issue of how do you deal with uh, something that has such huge divergence between two camps and between rural and yeah. urban and the realities of more populated areas and those where it's more recreational. And, and with, with Congressman Hill, it wasn't about Bentonville and it wasn't about his Arkansas. The last number of days have just been 
absolutely horrific going back to the University of Virginia. It's a tragedy. And we, we report yeah. about this too often that we become numb to it, these shootings that take people's lives. I have become numb to it. I, I blew it. I didn't mention this with Congressman Hill. Well, no other way to put it. I mean, it's a, an ongoing <clears throat> drumbeat. Also, we're getting some other headlines that I want to bring to you. Uh, all Ukrainian regions have emergency power cuts. This according to the grid operator. So <clears throat> the conflict is uh, developing over there. And I'm really struck by the ongoing conflict that also has become sort of benumbing in the background to people yeah. who are not involved, but still very real and causing and real distress. I'm looking at a 26 degree statistic early next week for Kiev. Winter is upon them. And uh, as, as we've seen in the news, so Maria Today are reporting on this. This is really um, serious uh, as well. It is a Wednesday. I thought it'd be a quiet Wednesday. We could make jokes about Thanksgiving. Well, we're doing that. But the fact is the news flow is extraordinary. We need an update on Bitcoin. We're going to get that from Shanali Basak, I believe, uh, here and much more towards Genesis of Connecticut as well. Joining us as well with an economic view from the measured Wilmington Trust, Luke Tilly will join us. Futures up five. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In Chesapeake, Virginia, a shooter opened fire in a Walmart Tuesday night. Police say six people were killed. That shooter was a company employee. That's according to police. He is also dead and believed to have killed himself. At least five people were wounded. Chesapeake is Virginia's second largest city and is located next to Norfolk and Virginia Beach. Bloomberg has learned that the European Union is discussing capping the price of Russian crude oil at between $65 and $70 a barrel. The group of seven also involved in the talks. EU ambassadors are meeting today with the aim of approving the cap and mechanism and a proposed price level. Mortgage rates in the U.S. dropped again for the second week in a row. According to the Mortgage Bankers Association, the rate on a 30-year fixed loan fell 23 basis points to 6.67% last week. That's the lowest in two months. That could give a bit of a boost to the struggling housing market. Credit Suisse is warning that it will report a loss of up to $1.6 billion for the fourth quarter. Clients pulled as much as $88 billion of their money from the bank in the first few weeks of that quarter. That underscored concerns over restructuring efforts after years of scandal. And there's no hiring slump in the professional services business. EY is on track to hire around 220,000 people in the year ending next July. EY's big four rivals, as top accounting firms are known, are also on hiring sprees. PwC brought on 148,000 new workers in the 2022 financial year. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Bitcoin has incredible cycles, uh, you know, meteoric gains, whether it's 64x or 32x or 8x in the last cycle, and then 70 to 80% drawdowns, but it always survives because of the strength of the network. Um, so we certainly think Bitcoin will be around for the long haul, uh, but it's very, very volatile. Um, and, you know, most of what's gone on here recently is just bad actors in the space. Troy Guy Eske, uncommonly acute there on Bitcoin with FS Investments today. Lisa, there was he had a real distinction there of the future of this turmoil. He wasn't necessarily abandoning wholesale this concept yeah. of crypto. He wasn't yeah. saying it's not going to work, it's going to collapse. Right. And this really is the reason perhaps we haven't seen more right. contagion because he's not alone. One of the great things we do here is dovetail stories. We really try to make it a tapestry of what you can do, and particularly back over 20 years. Credit Suisse is blowing up today. We've reported here on any number of news items, of money leaving wealth management and that. And you go, well, where did this begin? Lisa alluded to that earlier in the show. Some people will say it began when a young Ken Molas walked out the door rapidly. After CSFB, DLJ, a guy named Molas running investment banking, 
waltzed to UBS in a short manner. So, Sonali Basic picks us up today on what Mr. Molis is doing this morning. He's all Bitcoin this morning. What is Mr. Molis doing? It's the truth. You have Molis and company now hired as an advisor on the Genesis restructuring here. Remember, it's not quite a restructuring yet. This is a company that has been flying around for days looking for money to shore up its lending business. And we like to think about this as crypto, but really it's lending like anything else. It is giving somebody an asset and hoping you get money in return. And so, yes. Right. Molis so it's Perella hired. Weinberg against Molis. Is this <laughs> Wall Street finally getting in yes. to Bitcoin or is it just they're, ch they're, they're finding a fee to get them to 12 uh, we, we joked around in the commercial break. The parents have come home, <laughs> and now Wall Street is stepping in. Perella Weinberg has been hired on FTX. Molis has been hired on the what Genesis What are they going to do? What do they actually do? They're trying to sell assets. They're trying to recapitalize the firms as they exist now. You guys were asking yesterday, are, are they being treated like adults here? And the answer is uh, yes, because the adults are now stepping in to each of these firms and trying to recover funds for people who lost real money. The adults have been in the room the whole time trying to profit from it. Let's be very clear. The adults are the <laughs> yeah. ones that possibly have been helping this entire arena stay afloat despite a lot of the skepticism. Yeah. How much are you starting to hear around the edges of uh, investors saying, look, a, the Ken Moses of the world have a lot of stake in this already, right. and B, they're looking for an entry point. I think the point that both of you made, too, is that the restructuring advisors get paid, and that is certainly the truth here. Uh, Molis, in particular, <laughs> was one of the early ones to be very vocal about starting a crypto business, and that's as they got into restructuring in the crypto business with Voyager and now with, uh, with Genesis as well. Now, you were talking about adults in the room. I was talking to a former Tiger Cub, or a Tiger Cub, yesterday. Uh, people are making money now in crypto. There's a huge arbitrage trade between not just the grayscale Bitcoin trusts, but between Bitcoin futures and spot prices. And there's also shorts being put on other crypto assets as well, including certain stable coins, which may not play out. But if it does, it would play out big. So FTX happened and people talked about the casino closing. Now people are going <laughs> ka and they're still playing in the casino. New casino. A new casino. Is this casino sustainable? Well, it is until it isn't, right? I mean, when you look at Genesis, if you're borrowing from somebody who was not going to exist at the end, potentially, your leverage is mm. gone. So who is the new lender of last resort? I think we you're have not learned me. that yet. You're <laughs> killing me. It's Help, let's do Drexel Burnham Lambert sure. 101. What's crypto restructuring look like? You, t you go down, the debt goes down to 21 cents on the dollar. You do a restructuring. Somebody gets a preferred cash flow, blah, blah, blah. You know this better than me. I don't believe that here if there's no underlying profit, no underlying cash flow. Do Perella Weinberg and Mollis think that there's an underlying cash flow to do a quote unquote restructuring that Peter and Ken did in their ute? To the extent that certain firms have filed for bankruptcy, yes. We know that FTX has more than a billion dollars in cash. They have other assets around the world in terms of certainly they have certain assets that were not included in this bankruptcy. Peter remember. Weinberg is going to do a transaction <laughs> off a, a bungalow in the Bahamas. <gasps> they will go after hard assets, I'm certain. <laughs> but listen, there's another thing to think about here, and it's not just the assets that are at FTX or at Genesis. Remember, the reason over the last couple of days that so much of Wall Street had a hard time stomaching the idea of lending to these businesses as they seek restructuring is because there are a lot of intercompany relationships. One of the things we reported yesterday with Genesis was that, for example, there was an intercompany loan. There, were, uh, there was a promissory note between Digital Currency Group and between Genesis, which was what spooked a lot of investors. They didn't want to get in and then be lower in the capital stack than the folks that have started these businesses in the first place. So it's not just the assets they have, Tom. It's an idea of, okay, if I'm I'm giving these folks more money. Do I owe some other guy at the end of the day? How weird is that? So when you talk to your sources, how many of them actually say that there is profound fear, an existential questioning of an asset class that some people say isn't really an asset class? It's a game. It's a theory that got started up during an era of free money. How many people are still talking like that? And how many people just accept that this is a staying power kind of place? So... You're, everyone's going to hate me, to your point here. It's not just crypto, 
Bitcoin has held up. What was your price target, Tom, on Bitcoin again? I, I don't <laughs> have a published price target. If I did, I'd be in the surveillance timeout chair. But on technicals. Pharaoh's in it right now, but that's besides. But on technicals, to the extent that even if you thought it went lower, people don't think Bitcoin is crashing. People don't think Ethereum is crashing. If you look at Ethereum yields, they're still. Chanel, about it went from 60,000 to 16,000. That's not crashing? It's crashed down, but it's held fairly stable. And the weirdness of it, here's the weirdness of it. You have Kathy Wood saying yesterday that it, she thinks it'll go to a million still. Uh, I talked to Mike Novogratz the other day, who will not drop his five-year, 500,000 target. I know, I saw that. He won't drop it. And so I I don't okay. know how you get there from okay. 16,000. Lisa and I are going to go over and watch the balloons get blown up on the Upper West Side for the Macy's Parade. <laughs> Where are we on Monday? Where are we on Monday? To the extent, here's a one important part of the FTX debacle. They won't publish their list of 50 creditors. They won't give names. Why does that matter? Is that because Ken Mollis is on the list? It's because it's a joke, <laughs> folks. Ken, I'm sorry. I had to do it. It's because uh, the list of 50, they've asked for privacy for those creditors in the wake Why? of the bankruptcy hearing. They don't want them to get hacked. They don't want. Oh, come on. This is. Delaware court. Delaware court's going to listen to that? For now, they said. They will revisit the issue in a in a number of weeks at a later hearing. But for now, they won't publish the list, and there's a lot of anger about that. But there is a lot of concern that if those predators were published, <clears throat> that there would be more runs on the bank. And so I know that there are a lot of people chasing down but you with money laundering. But you that. assume this is a bank. You just said runs on the bank. Where's the bank? It depends on who. First of all, their lawyers yesterday said it was a run on the bank. The FTX's own okay. lawyers, Fair. It's Sullivan and Fair. Cromwell, who do you know? Basic of history. Um, Sullivan and Cromwell also, right, played such a big role in the. They're involved history. here. They sure are, Tom. The, the, Does the Gensler get involved? Because all these fancy names are getting involved now. They sure are. You think so? <laughs> I, I think everyone would hope so. I think was that an update? <laughs> that was an update. <laughs> Shanali Basic with an update there on uh, Weinberg. Well, that'd be a great firm. Perella, Weinberg, Mollis. I mean, you know, they could. Are you ca- creating merch- banking I'm trying, to, yeah. I'm trying to get a fear to pay for the turkey. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Bloomberg Surveillance. surveillance what you will do is escape to the airport drive to grandma's over the hill and all that what do we do on a wednesday of thanksgiving it's a data dump at 8 30 we do that with michael mckee mike a lot of data at this moment yes you cannot uh, have a thanksgiving holiday without the data dump and we begin with a very busy morning uh with durable goods durable goods orders up one percent that's better than the four tenths anticipated and the four tenths from the month of September. So good news on the headline. X Transportation still strong, up half a percent. It was down half a percent in September. Capital goods orders, non-defense, X Air. This is the one the uh, economists watch and the Fed watches. <coughs> business spending, a proxy for business spending, up a strong one, uh, up a strong seven tenths uh, after a four tenths gain, uh, four tenths fall in October. Shipments, which would go into uh, GDP, uh, up 1.3 percent after. B- being down a half a percent. So business is still spending, and it's going to be interesting later this morning, see if the Atlanta Fed uh, GDP now yeah. number comes out. It's been up by about uh, four to four and a half percent. See if it goes higher on those news. Jobless claims, everybody's watching. Here's a jump, 240,000 yep. from 222,000 the prior week, and continuing claims really jump up uh, to 1,551,000 from 1,507,000. Uh, revised, the revision just came in at 1503000 But it does show that uh, right. we are seeing people who lose their jobs. Uh, it's taking a little bit longer for them to get jobs. But we're not seeing a right. huge jump in jobless claims that a lot of people were looking for after all the tech layoff. Well, on the market move here on a Wednesday before Thanksgiving, not all that much. But, Mike, I'm going to go uh, introverted here and look at the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index, which you know is going the wrong way for Chairman Powell. With this data... The Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index becomes ever more accommodative. Is this set of reports bad news for the chairman, and is he losing control of the dialogue into the December 14th meeting? 
Well, I don't think he's losing control, but there's certainly a lot of debate on Wall Street about how far they have to go. The Fed's focused not so much on uh, the economy's growth as it is on the inflation rate. And if inflation comes down and the economy keeps growing, so much the better. That's the soft landing story, so they'll keep an eye on that. But it doesn't help the Fed's story to have financial conditions continue to ease. And when you have numbers like this, that's going to be good for stocks, which is going to put pressure on the financial conditions index, make it uh, go up a little bit, get a little bit looser. Well, meanwhile, we are seeing a little bit of a lift in yields. And this, to me, is interesting because we saw a bigger than expected jobless claims figure. Basically, this should be a weaker than expected print, which means that it would give perhaps a sense that perhaps the jobs, the job cuts are starting to pick up. Why is that not the case? Is this basically just noisy? at this point and irrelevant um, before we get the real jobs numbers next Friday. Well, it is noisy, and you have a problem during the holidays with jobless claims seasonally adjusting them because the uh, holidays <clears throat> move every year. So I don't think people will pay quite as much attention to the levels as uh, the direction, and the direction is going in the way people thought it would, that we would start to see more jobs uh, lost, more people applying for benefits, but not uh, in huge numbers. There's not been a spurt higher, and that's what uh, I think uh, would really worry investors is uh, right. if we saw that, then they'd anticipate unemployment going up significantly, and then you'd want to start to trade on the idea of a Fed rate cut. Michael McKee, thank you so much. Red and green on the screen, folks. Don't want to oversell it here. It's just a Wednesday churn here looking for direction, but clearly 2 ten spread, Lisa. we got to take a moment on this, going down to 78 basis points. There it goes. It, it, I've been waiting for what's happening literally right now on the screen, which is we may get curve inversion down to 80 basis points. We don't have it yet, but it's in moving in that direction. People gaming out what it could be with 100 basis <clears throat> points, basically. Uh, we are seeing resolve, and we will likely see that resolve later on today at 2 p.m. when we get Fed Reserve minutes when they talk about how much they are committed to keeping rates around 5% yeah. or higher. My head's spinning, and more data here uh, through the morning. It's a, it's a huge data dump on a Wednesday. Luke Tilly joins Chief Economist at Wilmington Trust uh, this morning. Luke, do you have a 2023 outlook or do you have to wait for this data, wait for the inflation data in December, wait for the jobs data and wait for the Fed meeting before you can develop an outlook? Well, we always have an outlook and we're expecting uh, a mild recession just slightly uh, more likely than a soft landing because it's really challenging and it comes back down to the inflation data as you were just talking about with Mike. I think that today's report is really positive for GDP, those capital yep. goods shipments, X air, uh, really strong revised up from the previous month and that really points to some of those strong GDP numbers. So it's gonna come down to inflation and what, how the Fed reacts to all of these numbers and like the labor numbers that you were just discussing. In your work for what I'm gonna call a conservative shop, Wilmington Trust idea folks, a short term is three years, maybe even five years to put things in perspective. Do you see a break in the labor market to accompany inflation concerns? We think that the labor market is obviously still tight. We're seeing that even with the jump in continuing claims that we saw, they're still well below the norms that we would have had pre-pandemic. And I think the market is keying in on that. Uh, on the more positive side, we've seen that decline in job openings. They're still really high. But really, the takeaway here is that wage growth is slowing on a three-month annualized basis, down to 3.9%, way down from the heady days last year where it was 6.5%. So we're getting pretty close to normal wage growth, but we still think that there's some upside risk there. And that's really one of the big risks to inflation and why we're a little bit cautious and why we're neutral to equities overall, Tom. So how do you talk about this, Luke, that you see actually the potential for wage growth to reassert itself, but there is clear softening in the labor market, as you point out, uh, with Indeed's uh, metrics as well as others. How do you parse those two ideas, softening in a labor market, yet still concern about a wage spiral or sort of wage inflation preeminent, uh, remaining uh, preeminent? Yeah, it's a great question, Lisa. And we're not worried about a wage spiral per se, uh, but the labor market is just like uh, about anything in macro right now, where it used to be really bad, it has definitely improved, but it's not back to normal. And you can almost say that for everything, whether it's inflation or wage growth. And when it comes back to the labor market, we know that a lot of the people who are still missing, quote unquote, from the labor market are permanently retired. And what we really need to see is more people re-entering the labor market that are still in those younger cohorts. We haven't seen that yet. The labor force has been very low, and that could keep the pressure on in wages uh, for firms to deal with. 
And that's still the upside risk on a, on a longer term basis, Lisa. When we came out 2023, along with employment, people are looking at the housing market as a tea leaf of how the Federal Reserve is transmitting its policy. And we've already seen mortgage rates go up to 7 percent, then come down to a lesser high. We have seen softening. How big of a route do you see in the housing market and how does that trickle out, bleed out into the other areas of the economy that the Fed is trying to affect? Yeah, this is incredibly important because, of course, a house is the largest asset for more, most households. And they've experienced such a run up in the house price appreciation. And we saw the mortgage numbers still very low, ticked up a little bit this morning. The housing market is going to be key. And what we see people doing now is even though mortgage apps are picking up as the uh, rates have gone down, probably trading down to lower prices, we see the down pressure on prices. Thankfully, compared to 14 years ago or so, people have not been treating their houses like piggy banks with so much home equity. So it's not going to well, damage consumer spending as much. So we're really looking for job growth as the main driver of consumer spending. I could go 20 minutes on this, Luke, and we don't have it. Are you suggesting that housing could be a disinflationary force in the next year? It should be a disinflationary force in the next year, but we know with the data that even once we see the softening in home prices and even in rents, it takes eight to 12 months for that to play through to the CPI. So even though everybody, including Chair Powell and the FOMC, can see uh, the weakness in those prices, it's going to take a while for, for it to show up in CPI. And we still have an inflation problem over the next six months, even though it's going to be decelerating. Look, Tilly, thank you so much with Wilmington Trust. Lisa Bramowitz on the 210 spread, the vanilla spread, from a negative 76 basis points. We blow through 78 basis points, almost got to 80 points, not quite there yet. The idea that you're getting paid more than 4% to own two-year debt while you're getting paid much less than that to own longer-term debt speaks to the lack of investment incentive in the short term of so many banks and so many companies and you're hearing this on the peripheries, when you talk to executives, they're holding off a little bit on putting stuff out there. And so how much do you start to see that trickling in, uh, in into the economy in a more substantial way? And what does it say about the character of a presumed recession? I think, you know, seriously, into the writing over the weekend, and everybody will publish over the weekend into Monday, what does it say about the recession bet? We heard from Mr. Tilly there some real, not confusion, but uncertainty about what it looks like. Right now, the consensus is a shallow recession. And we keep hearing that, that it's going to be something that's not going to be too deep and that will emerge from it. How much can we actually see that if we are seeing this incredible curve inversion and throwbacks to 1981? We're going to parse through that, not only in the U.S., but also over in Europe. Luca Paolini of Pictet Asset Management, as well as Esti Dweck of Flowbank, uh, is going to be joining us. Yes, Jack Caffrey of J.P. Morgan also uh, weighing in to try to really game out a 2023 of two halves. That seems to be a theme right now. First half being bad, the second one being good. Optimism, rebuild. Building. Red and green on the screen right now, and the VIX 21.60 showing the good week we've seen in equities. We'll really have to see how this unfolds, I should say, on a Wednesday. Lisa Bramowitz and Tom Keen and John Farrow. We hope that you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Great to hear from Americans worldwide celebrating in their own uh, way. And it's a Thanksgiving where I guess the heated debate about inflation, as we heard there uh, from Luke Tilly, inflation is tangible. And I go back to OECD earlier this week saying global inflation only gets down to 6.8 percent out there. Maybe that's not an American story, but. Yes, I think inflation is a Thanksgiving story. The OECD also pointed out this was an energy shock. And how much will this continue to be an energy shock? Jeff Curry, really, with salient points. That's what we saw in the grocery store. Talking about how, well, I mean, this really feeds into everything. And if you get uh, some sort of resurgence in activity, what does that do to the oil shock? Sterling on a path to 120. We heard about that earlier, 119.78 on Sterling. And again, red and green on the screen. Coming up, we are thrilled to bring you Alan Blinder. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. For the second time in just a few days, there's been a mass shooting in the U.S. This time it took place in Chesapeake, Virginia, where a shooter opened fire in a Walmart Tuesday night. Police say six people were killed, at least five others wounded. The gunman was described as a Walmart employee. Police say they believe he killed himself. 
The disgraced founder of the collapsed crypto exchange FTX has apologized to staff in a letter. Sam Bankman-Fried outlined what he called a crash in collateral from $60 billion to $9 billion. So far, bankruptcy proceedings have depicted FTX as a business with unusual lax documentation and financial controls. The Federal Reserve is set to show how united policymakers were over a higher peak for interest rates than previously signaled. Minutes from this month's meeting are released today. After that meeting, Fed Chair Jerome Powell said that rates would probably rise higher than projections in September had indicated. Jerusalem was rocked by two explosions today, killing one person and wounding at least 14. It was a sharp escalation after months of violence between Israelis and Palestinians. The militant groups Hamas and Islamic Jihad both praised the attacks. The White House condemned the blasts and offered to help Israel, Israel in its investigation. And the world's largest maker of agricultural machinery expects profit to surge to a record next year. Deere is projecting net income for the fiscal year that beat Wall Street estimates. And that's after posting better than expected fourth quarter earnings. Deere has benefited from the rise in farmers' incomes. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. inflation, restoring price stability remains the number one focus of the FOMC, and we're committed to using our tools to put inflation on a sustainable downward trajectory to 2 percent. The mathematician from Cleveland, Loretta Mester, exceptionally qualified to comment on your American economy. She is a Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland uh, president. This is a joy, and as we all migrate over the river and through the woods, it is important to understand that Blinder of Princeton will grace the door of grandchildren. We speak to him before he celebrates Thanksgiving. He is the former vice chairman of the Fed and, of course, always and forever with his Princeton University. Alan Blinder, your book is wildly accessible. To review, folks, there is Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz, a thousand pages, maybe 800 pages. There's Alan Meltzer, 3,000 pages. This is whatever your politics, the readable book of 400 pages on a monetary and fiscal history of the United States. Alan, how did you keep the book so short? What did you have to do to keep it under 500 pages? Well. It's a, it's, a, it's a very fair question. I think what you have to do is be the editor-in-chief. Uh, I do not have every detail that you could imagine. You know, if you read, look at Alan Melser's book, you can almost go FOMC meeting by FOMC meeting and see what everybody said. Uh, sad, I, know, I was going to say sadly. I don't think it's sadly. You don't find that here. But you do find uh, the basic storyline of what was going on with monetary policy and fiscal policy, by the way, and what were the big issues of the day and how were they resolved and sort of where we think right. we have answers were those good decisions or bad decisions. To, to me, the singular distinction right now is your chapter 14 where you say, all together now, it was unthinkable for Alan Greenspan to comment on the dollar. And with the various crises, the once-in-a-lifetime crises we've enjoyed, we now have a Fed in bed with the Treasury talking about the dollar and, and, frankly, social policy as well. Where do we go from our present altogether now? Well, I think in time, this is not happening right away, but in time you're going to see more of a separation between the Fed and the Treasury. In that sense, back towards the traditional uh, uh, system, in the at least in the United States, not around the world, by the way, but in the uh, in the United States, the pa the pandemic crisis just insisted that the Treasury and the Fed, um, you know, snuggle up together. Or well, that's a, that's a bad metaphor. <clears throat> work towards the same goals, really, and it, right. and not have any distance showing between the right. two of them. There were uh, liquidity facilities that the Fed created, lending facilities that the Fed created, backstopped by the Treasury. That kind of cooperation was dictated by the circumstances. Hopefully, we all think we're going to get back to right. normal. 
Well, back to normal was Vice Chairman Blinder speaking, and white smoke came out of the chimney in advance to let people know what was going to be said. Is there too much Fed speak today, Alan? I don't think so. I mean, an elusive but reasonable goal, but it's elusive, uh, is to get the Fed speaking with one voice. That's not so easy when there are 19 members on the FOMC, but it's not been too bad. I mean, there are other committees around the world that are speaking with many more conflicting voices than the FOMC uh, does. But, you know, my view, people have often criticized the uh, tendency to speak too much. And my view is if you've confused people by speaking too much, say more so they're not confused anymore. And by the way, without, without any advice from me, Jay Powell does that. When he right. sees that the markets and other people are getting it wrong, he speaks up again to help them get it right. Alan Blinder, you're talking to finance wannabes at Princeton, and that's a wonderful and, and, and good thing. As you mentioned, Chairman Powell and others, including Vice Chairman Brainerd, try to speak in a safe manner, getting out to an ex-post reality where they can react. The financial media and frankly, much of Wall Street is now in a parlor game of futures, trying to find not only the path up to a terminal rate, but then to game a pivot to a more accommodative stance. You and I have right. never seen this. How do we extricate ourselves from this silliness? Well, I think you, the Fed will extricate itself uh, from, by, by its actions and its words. Remember the Jackson Hole speech of uh, Chair Powell, the whole purpose of that was to shake out of the market's heads the notion that this would be a quick peak in the Fed funds rate, and then it would start coming down right away. I mean, he said very, he made it very clear that that was not going to happen, and we don't think that's going to uh, happen either. Uh, we're not going to get rid of the constant, incessant drumbeat of disparate chatter about the Fed coming out of market people. You know, that's their constitutional right, uh, so to speak. And they will say what they say. But the clever people will keep their eye on the ball and, uh, and right. filter through a lot of that noise and pay attention to what's really coming out of the Fed's mouth. And that mainly means the Fed chairman's right. mouth. Alan Blinder, one final question on your majesty of 40, 50, 60 years of Fed policy. There's the unknown unknowns out there like Dr. Alarian would speak of. And one of the great unknowns, thinking of the laureate Paul Romer, is the effect of technology on Alan Blinder's economy. Do we actually really know what technology is doing to us right now? We most definitively don't. Uh, one of the things, you know, e economists aren't that great at forecasting, period. But one of the things we really cannot forecast, and it's not just us, nobody can forecast to your question, is the sort of changes in the long run trend of productivity. These things happen now and then, not every year, not every two years, but they do happen and they almost always hit us by surprise. And in some cases, even looking back over years or decades, we don't, still don't understand quite what in the world happened. You know, the 90, 1995 acceleration of productivity, I think we understand that it had to do with companies learning how to use all those computers they had hanging around. But the 1973 plus slowdown, we still don't understand. Here we are in the year 2022. And, you know, productivity growth just slowed down and we don't know why. I, I, I will not mince words, folks. Checking it at under 500 pages, a monetary and fiscal history of the United States from the time of John F. Kennedy is without question the most readable Fed history I've seen, of course, from Alan Blinder of Princeton University. Alan, thank you so much for joining us uh, before dinner with said grandchildren. Uh, futures are negative four, Dow futures are negative uh, 48. Lots going on. I really want to, we underplayed this this morning. Lisa and I have been so busy with the news. Jeffrey Curry of Goldman Sachs was really something about down $3, American oil, 78.19 a barrel, and the idea of Brent crude, $85.30, down from the 90 level of just a number of uh, days ago. He is heated with d dynamics in demand and dynamics in supply that we could revisit $100 a barrel or even higher. Boy, would that change the debate as well. Please stay with us. An important conversation with David Weston. This is with 
Mr. Clyburn, he is a Democrat uh, with Nancy Pelosi. That'll be a timely conversation on Balance of Power, 12 noon. Have a great Thanksgiving.